The meeting will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Joint House and Senate Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with uh, the Senate, uh, and Senator Rood is going to be uh, serving as co-chair in this meeting. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen could not be here today, uh, and there are a number of other folks who are unable to be here from both the House and the Senate. Um, just a little bit of a road map. Uh, we have about two hours scheduled for today. We have a number of scheduled speakers. I've already had uh, two members of the public who want to testify. So if there are uh, people who want to testify uh, during the public testimony, make sure you contact the pages. If the pages want to raise their hands, and just let them know and they'll get a note up to us. Uh, at the end of last session, uh, during the conference committee, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and I had made an agreement that we would have continual updates uh, on chronic waste and disease as a joint level to show our, uh, the importance of this issue and the urgency of the issue. And so this is the first of those. Uh, we had hoped to have an earlier one, but uh, sometimes time gets in the way a little bit. Uh, so uh, we have the agencies and the university with us. Uh, to talk about chronic waste and disease, and also in the last couple months, there's also been EHD, episodic hemorrhagic disease, and so we'll be getting an update on that. Um, and uh, our first speakers this morning are from both a combination of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And so uh, we will conduct this as a hearing. We are uh, on camera as well and there'll be a number of people coming and going uh, throughout the day. So uh, welcome to our Senate colleagues. Uh, and Senator Rood, do you want to just say anything? Or? Uh, just, just welcome. And uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen uh, sends his regrets that he cannot be here today. Um, so I think uh, we're looking forward to a really good informational hearing, and I'm excited to see what's going on in the field. So we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, so, Mr. Benke and Ms. Karstensen, welcome, and uh, could you tell us what's happening? Thank you. Good morning, representatives, senators. Thank you for having us here. My name is Dr. Michelle Karstensen, and I'm with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and I'm the leader of our Wildlife Health Unit. Do you want to introduce yourself, Dave? Good morning. Dave Benke with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I apologize for my voice. I've got a little cold, and I've got a six-month-old German short-haired pointer. You know how that goes when they're young, so the field corrections and colds don't necessarily go together. And my name is Brian Luth. I'm the uh, Wildlife Habitat Program Manager with the Department of Natural Resources, and I was asked to lead the Adopt a Dumpster Program for DNR. Just bef before you start, uh, Representative Erickson noted that we have the Malacca High School students that are in Foods and Nutrition class and Life Smarts class here to observe the hearing. So welcome. Proceed. Okay. Uh, first, we're going to talk this morning about our um, CWD surveillance uh, in Minnesota and really the implications for the solid waste disposal side. So the number one way, of course, to prevent wildlife diseases is something that we preach uh, a lot in our program is prevent, prevent, prevent. That's the best that we can do is to try to not have a disease in our state. And particularly once it gets established in a wild population, it's extremely difficult to get rid of. <laughs> And this is a map that you have in your packet. This is our current distribution of chronic waste and disease in southeast Minnesota, where we have the most cases. Uh, so this is through last fall and, and early winter. Uh, so we have 50 cases here in the southeast from 2016 to present. And the counties that are affected in southeast Minnesota include Fillmore, Winona, and Houston. And then uh, we first detected chronic waste and disease north, north central Minnesota near Brainerd. Um, and it was uh, first found in a captive <laughs> servant farm near Merrifield. And we did some extensive surveillance around that facility for two falls, looking to see if disease was also in the wild population. And we did not find any disease in wild deer after testing about 9,000 samples. However, there was a doe that was found uh, dead uh, on a private residence about a half mile from where the farm was. And that deer did have chronic waste and disease. So that was our first detection of this disease in north central Minnesota. And that was in uh, February uh, of 20, 2019. 
So the two biggest risks that we think are spreading disease across North America are really two things. The movement of live cervids, and that's either through cervid industry or wildlife agencies moving animals around, and the movement of, car of cervid parts, carcasses, and their remains. And so to try to address this, we've had a carcass ban in place for two decades already that focused on where the disease was known to occur. And that's been the same areas um, of concern for both the Board of Animal Health and DNR. But in 2016, we expanded this to make it a blanket rule so that whole carcasses so couldn't come in. We have a question. So. Sure. Dr. Dr. Sorry to interrupt, but Dr. Du, uh, on the page, the two biggest risks for spreading, is that a hypothesis or is that, is that something you know? That's a, a conclusion from the wildlife community, so from uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies that's identified in their uh, best management practices as the two biggest risks contributing to spread of this disease across North America. So, so the conclusion is proof or the conclusion is guessing? I think a little of both. Okay. Yeah. So back to our carcass ban. So in 2016, we made this ban, a blanket ban, to try to address risk coming into Minnesota where surveillance might not be occurring at a high level. And we might have hunters hunting out of state in areas where the disease occurs, but it's not yet identified. And so this blanket ban was put together in 2016 and then made rule this last session. And so this, this little uh, animation here just shows what we're talking about with potential risk. This is a map of the U.S. with the four counties uh, in southern Wisconsin highlighted that have the most chronic waste and disease. This is where prevalences are exceeding 50% in males and over 30% in females. And if we look at thinking about risk, this next slide shows the home zip codes of hunters that successfully harvested a deer in one of those four counties in the 2016-17 deer season. So we don't know that whole carcasses left with these hunters, but just showing you that uh, how much of a a widespread you know, concern it is that hunters are traveling across state borders and harvesting animals and potentially bringing these animals back to their home state. So this is why we've, we've identified this blanket ban as very important. We also contacted hunters in Minnesota for the 12 states that have the most chronic wasting disease last year and sent them letters to their homes to let them know about this rule to make sure the education piece is being done properly and they're aware of this change. We also made two videos that are available on our website that deal with how to cape your deer. If you, ha if you harvest a trophy animal out of state and you want to bring that back, you can cape it yourself. We also have a video about how to quarter your deer. So it's really having our hunters that hunt out of state plan ahead, make a plan, identify a taxidermist you might want to work with in Colorado or Wyoming where you're hunting, bring coolers and, and pack that meat back so that you're not taking these parts of the animals back into Minnesota that have the highest risk for bringing disease here. And so the, the concept is the risk is low when you quarter and go. And you'll see this messaging uh, throughout what we're doing in state too. So managing deer carcass waste streams, there's really uh, several approved methods. And so number one would be the alkaline digestion at the University of Minnesota. Now this is proven to denature the prion. So this digester is at the U of M's diagnostic lab. And uh, that is uh, um, something we utilize when we can pull a known positive carcass out of the waste stream we do bring it there for digestion. Uh, second, a line landfill. So this is clay line landfills. So science has also shown us that clay liners and clay minerals bind to prions very tightly. And that some work has been done in Wisconsin really to show that a line landfill is a good containment system for prions. Um, also incineration. If there's an industrial incinerator available or even wood fired that can exceed temperatures over 1500 degrees, that can denature prions. So if we think about the 52 deer that we've had in Minnesota so far, I went back through our list and looked at where do we think they went into the waste streams. And so 19 of these animals um, went entirely to this digester at the University of Minnesota, where we were able to obtain the entire carcass and bring it to the digester. 26 of those individuals had uh, butcher remains that went to line landfills, but the meat themselves, the venison that was retained by the hunters, was surrendered to us, and we took that to the digester. Two of them went through a meat processor waste stream, and five were left on a landscape uh, by the hunters and mostly scavenged by the time we were able to contact them and recover what remains were left, which we often still did, including uh, trying to remove soil and so forth. So this is a, a picture of what's happened so far to the deer known to have chronic wasting disease in Minnesota. Dr. Carstens, yes. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, noticing the meat processor waste stream, could you talk a little bit about what happens um, as far as communicating with the meat processors and 
you know, what the best practices are for them when they know that they've been dealing with an infected carcass? Dr. Carstensen. Um, sure. Uh, the, the meat processor waste stream is actually regulated by Department of Ag. Um, so that isn't something that DNR regulates. We have uh, sent letters to all meat processors and taxidermists in Minnesota informing them of chronic waste and disease, especially the carcass import rules that we're talking about. Um, and we're recommending that they use line landfills. We don't have any authorities to enforce their waste stream. Might be something we consider looking into going forward. But the two uh, carcasses that I have mentioned here did go to line landfills. One was through a metro removal and one was through uh, in southeast. Representative Becker Finn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I'm not so much concerned with the, the end result of where the carcass went, but the safety of the meat processor and their facility. Um, when we do have a positive, is that communicated directly to the person who was handling the meat? I, I mean, I understand the Department of Ag has the authority. I don't think they're here. Are they here they today? Are here. They are here. Okay. Dr. Carstensen. Um, Senator, so the, uh, um, in the cases where we've had these positives, we notify the hunter, not necessarily the end, end game of what they did with that animal. So the notifications to the hunter themselves, not necessarily where they decided to take that deer and what they did with it. And so when it comes to the meat processing side, in some of our areas um, in the past, meat processors have decided to hold carcasses until results came through and then process the venison. But that's really a business decision by the meat processor. If they choose to run them through ahead of time, they might have a positive animal that went through that system. And that's a business risk that they need to evaluate and decide for themselves. Um, but uh, I think we, you know, we offer the best practices, but we don't always control what they can do. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and this will be my last comment. But I, um, it isn't just a business decision if it's a public health issue to other people who are using that facility. And I, I think we're going to have to do more to make sure we're protecting folks. It's not um, simply a matter of business risk. Thank you. I think if Mr. Kessis, when he speaks from the Board of Animal Health, could maybe address what Ag is doing. Um, I have a question about the 19 uh, whole carcasses to the digester. Were those transported by DNR staff or were they transported by U of M staff? How, how are they moving? Representative Hansen, yes, those are transported by us, by DNR, to the digester um, and then delivered directly uh, through the loading dock to the facility. Any other questions? Proceed. Okay, so thinking about options, uh, about what, what hunters can do to dispose of their carcass, there's really three things by rule uh, for DNR that they need to do after they harvest their deer. Number one is register your deer. You can do that online, through the phone or internet. Um, number two is where we have surveillance zones in place, the surveillance is now mandatory. So it's complying with the mandatory testing. Uh, and that can be through either the self-service sampling stations that are available currently for archery and throughout muzzleloader season, or in person at check stations where staff will be uh, throughout the firearm season. And then the other rule is that uh, we have a carcass movement restriction in place within our zones where you can't take the whole animal outside of our zones. And so um, that really uh, uh, then falls to the hunter to decide what they want to do. And their options are use a meat processor inside the zone. Um, they can hang the deer at camp like they have done probably for most of their hunting traditions and, uh, and wait to process the animal until the test results are back if they choose. If the test results are clear and they want to dispose of that carcass on the landscape, they certainly can do so. They can also quarter their deer. We have quartering stations in place in our zones and place those remains in a dumpster. And that's where we get to the adopted dumpster program. And our intent there is for it to be uh, hauled to a line landfill where we believe that's a great containment system. So, and so the Dr. last slide Dr. I have. Dr. Yes, Carstensen, just uh, on that second bullet point, hang the deer or place the carcass. So just if I mm -hmm. was butchering my deer and, and, and then I have the bones and, and scrap uh, and it, the test comes back negative, uh, that can be left on the property for scavenging or decomposition. Is that correct? Yes, Representative Hanson. We would see that to be extremely low risk and up to the hunter to, to decide how they want to remove those remains. Yes. And so final slide for my part here is, you know, basically we believe the landfills are part of our solution and we need to be partnering with the solid waste community because we want to go from here, whereas a hunter, you know, is harvesting his deer hanging on the meat pole 
And we, we absolutely know the risk of CWD exists when carcass remains are left on the landscape when there's prions involved because of that stability in the environment and that infectivity that can happen for a long period of time, possibly decades. And so we want to reduce that risk. And we believe if uh, we can do the testing and properly dispose of these butcher remains through our dumpster program, that we're doing our best to minimize risks in these areas where we know the disease is to occur. Thank you. Okay, so this first slide is just kind of a summary of the uh, legislation this past spring that established the adopt a dumpster program. Uh, quickly, overview was 50,000 from the Wild Servid Health account uh, in the Game and Fish Fund to provide dumpsters dedicated to disposing of deer carcasses where CWD, CWD has been detected. Work with waste haulers and other interested parties and encourage volunteer support so that the dumpsters are located conveniently uh, with signage lined and maintained. Um, dispose of the carcasses properly. Work with the Department of Health and Pollution Control Agency to develop guidelines for hunters for handling deer and transporting and disposing for solid waste facilities and solid waste haulers for handling, processing, and disposal, and uh, taxidermists and meat pro processors for proper handling, processing, and disposal. And then submit a report uh, by January 15th. So our original plan uh, was, was somewhat ambitious and I think uh, optimistic. Uh, we wanted to provide dumpsters as conveniently as possible so that a hunter wouldn't have to drive a long distance to find one of these dumpsters. Uh, on this map, we have green squares, and that's where we were planning to have dumpsters there, starting with the archery season all the way through the end of the muzzleloader season. Um, and then when the firearm season came along, we would add additional uh, <coughs> sites, um, which are depicted by the uh, blue triangles. Um, because that's when obviously the majority of deer are harvested and, and we needed you know, additional coverage. Uh, so you have the north, excuse me, the north central uh, block on the bottom and the southeast block on top. So when I started this program in early August, when I thought about a dumpster, what came to my mind is the image on the right, that small, uh, they can be anywhere from four yards all the way up to, to larger. Um, it's got a good hard plastic lid to exclude precipitation. Um, it can be hauled, a truck can pick up a numerous of these and, and make a single haul. Uh, but unfortunately, when we started contacting uh, vendors on our state contract, um, because the landfills wanted these uh, deer carcasses separate from the normal household waste, um, this was all they told us that they could provide. This is a large, what you would call a roll off. Uh, I think this particular one in this image is a 30-yard roll-off, so it's pretty tall, um, it's huge, and, and much larger than, than what we thought we needed. So just a little uh, a timeline sort of, of of how we went about this. So again, our, our first plan was to use our existing state contract for waste services. Um, there are vendors, you know, by county throughout the state. Two of the biggest ones are waste management and advanced disposal services. Advanced Disposal Services said, nope, we don't want to do this right off the bat. So we worked with uh, Waste Management. Uh, on about September 9th, uh, they told us that uh, they would not accept any deer carcasses in their landfills, landfills that they owned, but they would be willing to provide these large 20 to 30 yard roll-offs uh, for us and, and haul them to landfills that we thought would accept the, the carcasses. So. Uh, it was the week before deer, or the archery deer opener, so we quickly uh, used the purchase order to get six sites uh, uh, in, in place by the season opener on 9-14. Um, and I'll go through this list a little bit longer, but uh, as of yesterday, Waste Management informed us that they, will be, they are no longer able to provide this service for us. So they are walking away from the purchase orders and uh, we're scrambling to, to come up with another solution. So when we first learned that that uh, state contract option wasn't going to work conveniently for us, we, uh, we reached out to our partner groups, the Bluffland Whitetails Association, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, because they aren't bound by state procurement regulations. Uh, we thought they would have the ability to maybe work with a local vendor and get something set up uh, quickly so that we could provide additional coverage um, during the archery season. Uh, they were successful in... Uh, getting five additional sites, or Bluffland's White Pills uh, got five sites for us, and the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association got a, a single site. Um, and then we started uh, going through the bid process through our state procurement regulations. Uh, the first time we did a whole, we did a, a, a big package statewide, all 26 sites that we were looking for in a single 
bid, the, the vendors had the opportunity to bid site by site. Uh, results of that is we got <coughs> one bidder that was able to cover four sites for us. Uh, thankfully, two of them were sites that the Bluffland Whitetails Association had uh, their dumpsters on site, so we were able to leave them of that obligation and, and have them pull their dumpsters, have ours put there. Excuse me, roll offs. I'm going to keep using the word roll offs because that's what we're using. Um, they did some additional work uh, in the meantime, uh, and we also worked with our Department of Administration on a, what I'm calling a local bid approach, where we actually bid them out site by site. So 26 sites, individual bids, we sent out uh, direct solicitations to potential vendors. Um, each county licenses its haulers individually, so there's a finite list of, of haulers that can actually perform the service um, due to the licensing by the county. So. Uh, after that uh, bid process, we, we got three bidders. Um, we had two additional Bluffland Whitetails Association sites. Again, we could relieve them of the obligation and put our dumpsters there. We had two uh, sites that were around the, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association site. That site was actually uh, a, a MDHA member who was willing to provide that dumpster, excuse me, roll off on his property. Um, we were able to replace another DNR site where we had a separate purchase order at the Whitewater Wildlife Management Area, and then we got uh, one new site. Um, and some of these were just going to go in place during the firearm season, so that starts November 9th. So we've asked that those dumpsters be placed by November 8th. Uh, our plan then was to go back to uh, waste management as, as a state contract vendor. They had expressed the ability to provide this service for us with these large roll-offs. Um, but as I mentioned, as of yesterday, they informed us that they would no longer uh, be willing to handle this waste stream for us. And so uh, we're pretty much left uh, to, to a scramble to try to figure out uh, how we are going to manage um, this program from here on. Um, we've Mr. Also Mr. Lewis, I think we have a number of questions. Uh, Representative okay. Beckerfin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so back to the, the top of the page, did waste management give a reason for why they were unable um, to fulfill the obligation, and what was that reason? They said there was too much of a risk to their business. And we have about 450,000 hunters in the field in about 10 days. Representative Luke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have a question. I just got a comment. Um, I've had a number of issues uh, raised about uh, the state's process in dealing with waste management. Basically what happened, and this probably is not directly the DNR, but your agency was one of the participants. Uh, what waste management did here not too long ago was they got a hold of the state contract and they went through and they cherry picked all the nice big DNR sites and MnDOT sites and everything else on the main highways. Ran our effectively trying to run our small uh, waste management people out of business. What we need to understand here is, I'll give Aiken's a good example, right on Highway 169, big DNR building. Well, the rest of us are out at the end of the road, and those little contractors that, that serve all of rural northern Minnesota, they go way out on the township roads. They pick up waste out there. So this is a big problem, and it's way bigger than chronic wasting disease, and it does, it's, it's almost ironic uh, that as a state, we let them go out there, cherry pick the good stuff, and now they shoved it right back in your face. So I will certainly do my best to help with uh, rebuilding the relationship uh, that the state of Minnesota broke with all the small haulers out there. This is a big deal for rural counties because these big companies uh, that, that are operating like this, uh, shame on them, because there's people way out at the end of those township roads that there ain't a big lot of dollar. We, we spent decades building this at the county level. So again, uh, it's, Mr. Chair, it's a much bigger problem than uh, this is just a symptom uh, of something that, that thought we were smarter in St. Paul. Uh, and, uh, you, I mean, anything you do to hurt our little local waste management folks out there really is a big deal. Uh, you think you got problems down here arguing over who's going to pick up how many dumpsters you're going to have <laughs> in the big cities. You better just leave that alone. Thank you. Representative Eklund. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what I'm seeing here is down in the, south, in, in the southeast, it looks like you have some dumpsters uh, uh, in place that, are, that should be working. We're 10 days away. What's, what's going to happen in Crow Wing County? Well, I'd, I'd advance to that slide if I can find it. So this is the current status as of yesterday. Um, as you can see, um, the legend is uh, with a little eye, I guess, with the orange circle. Those are potential um, locations where we did get a, a bidder on these sites. Um, for example, in Crow Wing County, we did get a bidder uh, for uh, Niswa, Brainerd, Crosby, and Aiken, but it was $2,340 per pickup. And so initially we rejected that bid, um, but it's possible that we could rescind that rejection. I've been working with our, our business folks in the Department of Administration to ask, you know, what sort of possibilities do we have in some of these locations where we, we did get a bid, but we rejected it. Uh, similarly, in, in Preston, um, waste management was, was doing that work for us for less than what that bid was. So I, at that time, this was before we knew waste management was going to stop doing this for us. You know, I, we rejected that bid and, and kept the cheaper one. Um, but uh, w there are sites, you know, with the uh, black X's where we did not get any bids. And we also don't have, uh, some of them don't have a disposal location. Um, I'll go back to that other side, but landfills uh, limit their, the area where they will accept waste. So there's some of these sites, uh, like Austin, for example, where uh, not only did we not have a vendor bid, but we also don't know of a location because Olmstead County, which has been taking the, the carcasses up until now or until recently, um, would not accept outside of that area. Um, so I'm, I'm unclear. We had a contract and then it, it was voided or, or canceled or what? Yeah, we, we had a purchase order using the, uh, the quotes that were provided um, uh, well, actually, we got separate quotes, and it's my understanding from talking to our business folks that because uh, because of the handling of the waste, it, it can't be mixed with household waste, that pretty much took it off that contract. This is a whole uh, unique situation where uh, we had uh, required disposal at, at the Crow Wing County landfill, um, and, and only certain um, landfills would accept the waste. So um, they're basically walking away from the purchase order, and it's... You know, I'm not a procurement specialist, so the technicalities of that um, I don't understand, but I did talk with the person who set most of this stuff up, and she said, yeah, there's, there's nothing we can do to, to hold them to it because it technically was, it used the state contract, but it wasn't strictly by the state contract. Representative Eklund. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and that was a long answer. Not give me an answer. What's the plan <laughs> if you can't get a dumpster in place in Crow Wing County? What, well, <laughs> what, what are your plans for going forward on this? I'm, uh, I just talked with the buyer. They're working with the uh, Department of Administration, the, the Office of State Procurement, to see if we can go now to a sole source um, purchase where if we, can, if we can find a vendor, we can work with them directly and negotiate uh, an agreement and, and put that in place. But uh, that needs approval by... Uh, by the Office of State Procurement. Um, we're also thinking of options, you know, potentially self-hauling ourselves. Is this something we can do with our own DNR staff? You know, rent equipment, um, that's going to take additional <coughs> staff, um, but that's option we're exploring as well. And again, I, I mentioned that we did have vendors on some of these sites. I'm, I'm asking, uh, can we rescind the rejection of the original bid and accept the bid and, and get something in place? It would seem that risk is the issue here, and um, the risk is if there was a positive uh, with the negatives commingled in a dumpster, then how would you tell? Most people want to butcher their deer right away. Um, it's hard to hang a deer for 10 days to wait on those results. So. I think two years ago, Dr. Carsonson, you had a refrigerator semis at the Preston location. I mean, would that be some way of temporary uh, chillers to hold carcasses until um, there's verification of a positive or a negative? Oh, Representative Hansen, yeah, we did have uh, refrigerated semis in place 
in Preston uh, in, some, in previous years. However, now that our zone is so much larger, we have more uh, meat processors available and hanging space at businesses. So we're no longer planning to offer a reefer because we want to send the business to the private uh, individuals in our zones. In particular, in North Central, there's several meat processors that have uh, geared up with big semis of their own to try to take as much hunting business as they can. And, and again, we talked briefly about, are they gonna hold those deer individually? Are they gonna start processing them? I've heard both from some of these processors, so I'm not sure exactly their direction, but you're absolutely right that a hunter that wants to use these dumpsters is gonna put the waste in the waste stream at their convenience, and it's gonna be often way ahead of the test results coming in. So the ability to go back and try to identify parts in a dumpster with 50 other deer is no longer an option we can do. And so that's why there's some of this waste heading to the landfill for containment. And I think that's the, you know, the concern that we have. So we need to continue that relationship so that we have that end game. And what, what happens at the dumpster behind the processor if they have a vendor that refuses to pick up that dumpster? Mm -hmm. um, Representative Hanson, they'll have the same issues we're having right now. If, if the haulers aren't hauling the DNR dumpsters, they're likely not going to haul for the meat processors or taxidermists either. And so I'm assuming waste management informed other you know, clients besides DNR yesterday that they're lo no longer going to be hauling their waste stream. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is that working? I was going to wait until everybody was done, but seeing as how we're on this topic, uh, doing some research on this, and, and I always, I'm always leery of going on the internet and, and finding out what's real and what's not. But it, uh, uh, from some of the stuff I've read, there are certain soils that'll break down these prions. And one of the things that, that crossed my mind was, if we're going to put these in a, in a sealed landfill, then those prions last for years. Uh, is there other? Have you, have you looked at other options as far as is it true that? There are certain ways to break down these prions, and would it be better to put them in a place where we could break them down where they wouldn't live forever within a, within a landfill? I see, I see Dr. Larson nodding his head back there. I don't know if he wants to come down now, but um, Mr. Benke. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, one of the things that we've looked at is how to best handle those in the landfills, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute here. Um, but we'll, we'll get at kind of what our best management <laughs> practices are. But we've got several different kinds of landfills that we'll have to talk through here in just a second. So I'm Dr. Peter Larson, College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Minnesota. Um, I'll be testifying a little bit. One of the um, papers that I've provided on this issue with respect to breaking down prions, um, this is in the, the, um, a list in the testimony I'm providing. There's recent data suggesting that sodium hydroxide can break down prions. There's uh, research teams in South Korea that are dealing with this issue um, on cervid farms, and they're treating the soil, um, and they're figuring out compounds that can accelerate the breakdown of those prions. So that's one aspect of this discussion. Another is a paper that was recently published uh, using bleach, 40% bleach on stainless steel surfaces. That's the key word here, stainless steel surfaces, 40% bleach. That's um, uh, now been identified as a potential useful avenue for breaking down prions, CWD prions. With respect to soils and soil type, yes, there's different soil types. Um, those soil types will bind to, or prions will bind to those soil types in different ways. And it's really important to work with the DNR and others on, um, and, and all, all the soil types in the state of Minnesota has been mapped by uh, the extension office, right? We have that information. We know what these soil types are. We have county level maps. Um, we need to leverage that information and understand which soils um, are going to bind more effectively to these prions and, and which don't. And, and that information's out there. We just need to work together and do some predictive modeling. And that's the subject of a grant proposal that I've submitted alongside the DNR. And uh, for members and the folks watching at home, we will be posting the scientific paper titles, that the published papers that Dr. Larson is <coughs> referencing, that'll be on the House Committee website and the Senate could post as well, so you can reference that as we get to that later in the testimony. <coughs> Are there any other questions for the PCA? Did you want to proceed on mm -hmm. any more on where we're at here with the dumpster? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just finish up a couple of things I wanted to bring up, you know, is landfills. Um, I've mentioned that waste management uh, decided or made the decision that 
they wouldn't accept any deer carcasses in their landfills that they own. Uh, the uh, Olmstead County landfill recently told us that they will only accept what they call negative deer, and uh, we corrected them that there's no such thing as a negative deer. There's only a not detected deer, positive or not detected. So uh, then they said, well, we aren't going to accept any positive deer then, or we will only accept not detected deer. So uh, we're kind of in a, a, a limbo right there also because of uh, the processing of the leachate, which I'll just mention a bit, and, and Dave, I'm sure, will mention. Uh, and then limited area, like, uh, for example, Crow Wing County will only accept uh, deer carcasses from Crow Wing County. When we drew the, the boundary for the, for the zone, we used highways because that's, you know, pretty easy for a hunter to figure out which side of the road they're on. But it might not be easy for them to figure out which side of the county line they're on if they're in the middle of the woods and that line just passes through. So uh, we've run into issues with uh, uh, especially the Aiken dumpster because that's outside of Crow Wing County. Uh, we had to make arrangements for that dumpster to be hauled all the way to Mora. Uh, they were willing to accept uh, waste from Aiken County. That's part of their service area. And because there were no positive deer found in Aiken County up you know, to present, so they were willing to accept that. But it's created some other uh, sort of logistical issues. Uh, a big issue is free liquids. Um, obviously, uh, precipitation and other liquids in the landfill have to be managed as they percolate through the landfill. Um, and so uh, this past fall when we had rain, rain, and more rain, we had some serious issues with these large roll-offs. Uh, it was nearly impossible to provide a cover for that using a tarp um, that would withstand you know, these two and three inch deluge that we got. And we uh, had um, concern by the Crow Wing County Landfill, they're incinerating these deer and obviously pouring a bunch of water on an incinerator doesn't work. And so uh, we had to do some real consistent effort to try to figure out how can we keep rain out of these dumpsters and it's remained a struggle. That's a big span to, to try to cover. There are covers available for dumpsters, but it's my understanding talking to the vendors that they cost two or three thousand dollars to have a hard cover and for just this temporary need that we had, uh, they weren't willing to make that investment to have those just sit around for the rest of the year. Um, and then also the liners themselves, you know, uh, captured that rainfall and so it created you know, issues of, of how can we deal with it. And then obviously the warm temperatures early in the season, we had these great big 20, 30 yard roll offs with a handful of deer carcasses, but it smelled so bad that the sites that these were on uh, demanded that they be disposed of. And so we were making hauls uh, to landfills in a 20 yard, 30 yard dumpster that only contained six carcasses, but that's the best we could do. Um, so this is just a picture of, of a setup. This is the Rochester uh, site. Uh, you can see the large roll off. Uh, at, in this site, they experimented with using plywood across the top uh, on top of a tarp to try to exclude the rainfall. Uh, the problem was that the, the, that the driver, you know, then had to get out of the truck, throw those things off, and most often he did not replace them. And so we had to have staff follow up following a delivery to, to put this all back in place. The liners. Don't uh, sit well in a large container like that. The first carcass gets thrown in, the sides collapse. And so somebody, again, has to manage these uh, all the time to make sure that they're functioning. Uh, we had signage there to, to uh, draw hunters' attention. Attention says CWD zone deer disposal adopt the dumpster program. And then as, Mel excuse me, as Michelle mentioned, we also tried to provide some additional amenities for hunters to make it easy for them to process their carcasses. There's a picture of a tripod there that you, you hang the deer up in the air and then you can easily skin it and quarter it. Uh, there's a table there that they can work off of. Uh, and in that little tote, there were some wipes and a bone saw that help uh, hunters process their deer as, as easy as possible. I have a question, Representative Beckerfin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, kind of just getting through, getting back to thinking through the whole stream from you know, shooting a deer to where it ends up. Um, for folks who uh, take care of their deer at home, I mean, <laughs> we're telling them not to leave it on the landscape, and then we're potentially not going to have dumpsters easily accessible for them. Um, what are we communicating to folks? What is kind of the plan for those folks? Because it's ultimately going to end up in waste management garbage cans anyway. Um, you know, they don't have a way 
to monitor that. So I'm just curious if we've thought through what that's going to look like for people who process their deer at home. Dr. Uh, Carstensen. So, uh, you know, the, the, the concept was the adopt the dumpster program was going to have these in place until immediately and, and very recently, you know, we've now hit this new snafu about uh, what we're going to have available. Again, for the, the hunter that processes their deer at home, as I do, um, you know, one can uh, retain those remains even if you process the next day. Keep the carcass remains close by. Just don't have them on the landscape for scavengers to, dra to drag off next to the shed, inside the, you know, a building until the results are back. And once they're not detected, um, it's okay if you want to dispose of them elsewhere. Um, so we're hoping that we have the, car the dumpsters in place everywhere that we had intention before the firearm season. But uh, there still are options for um, handling those deer at home and waiting out the test results, even if you want to process that deer as soon as you feel that you want to. Uh, you certainly have that ability to do that. But just hang on to those remains. Keep them close. Representative becker -Finn. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, thinking this through, I can't keep my dog away from a dead squirrel in the backyard. I'm not sure. I mean, you guys know wildlife. I don't know, you know, just leaving it out on the, you know, maybe not in the back 40, but anywhere where animals are going to have access. You know, I guess the alternative is what I'm going to leave, like, rotting stuff in my garage. I, I, I just, I don't think that's a, a good enough option for folks if we're serious about this. So I know you just got the news from waste management yesterday, but I think we've got to think harder on this. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple questions that I'd like to bounce off of you with what you've presented here. One, I'm hearing that we appropriated $50,000 for the purpose of trying to procure dumpsters and we're here not sure if we're even going to have a single dumpster and then what would end up happening with that specific money that we uh, allocated for this project. Um, and second, I'm curious if it was just yesterday that you heard back from uh, waste management, when did this whole process of negotiating start? Like, is has this been ongoing since the summertime for months, or has this been something recent? I'm wondering if, if what's been happening on the planning side that you're uh, without your plan A option here at almost the 11th hour. Uh, to address your, Mr. Chair, yeah. address your first question, if you look at this map, um, where you see the box with the check mark, those are dumpsters that are in place. And so we do have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, currently in place with four additional dumpsters to, to be delivered uh, the Friday before the firearm season. So the green spaces, uh, the green boxes. I think it, it might be a different map. And actually, I, I apologize, the map that is actually in your handout is not the same that I'm displaying on the screen because of yesterday's changes. We had to update that map at the last hour, and um, and it, I don't think it got included in the, the printed out version, but it's on on the PowerPoint that you're seeing right here. And there was a separate handout. Just hand it Where is that? And then to, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yep. to address your second question, um, working with our business folks, because we had an existing state contract, I was naive uh, to think that this would be simple. We had vendors already lined up. It would be just a matter of, of cutting a purchase order with them to, to, to handle this waste. Um, it was September 9th when, they, when we first learned from waste management that, you know, they wouldn't take them to their uh, to their facilities and, it, and initially they said they wouldn't haul them at all. But then a second person called me and said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can haul them for you if you can provide uh, disposal locations. So um, it got late, got fast, and you know they were always our fallback option. I had requested uh, two weeks ago to waste management, 
to get quotes for all these additional sites that we didn't have vendors for. They, when I talked to the individual that I've been working with, he said, we've got all the dumpsters in the world. Um, sure, just let us know what you want. We want to update our quotes to, to provide better covers um, and, and any other small nuances we had learned in the past, like hauling the Aiken dumpster all the way to Mora instead of hauling it to Brainerd to the, to the landfill. So uh, that was all set to fall in place until uh, yesterday when we learned that they're backing out entirely. Is there anyone from Waste Management here or from Olmsted County? <clears throat> yeah, I do, I do want to say uh, I want to give a lot of credit to Crow Wing County themselves. They have done a lot of outreach with news releases in their community and inviting hunters to bring their carcasses directly to the landfill. And they they are providing that service. They've set up a dumpster right at the landfill where, where residents or, or any hunter can bring a deer that was taken in Crow Wing County um, and they will they basically stockpile them on site and then they can work them into their incinerator as they, uh, as they fire it up. It's not something that can be continuously fed. It's wood fired and so they pretty much have to do it batch by batch uh, in order for this to work for them. But again, I wanted to give them some credit because they've done some tremendous outreach to their hunters and they've offered this service uh, for hunters to bring it directly to the landfill up in Crow Wing County. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to the testifier, we're talking about this uh, incinerator in Crow Wing County. Um, do we have any idea just for the state's uh, benefit, what kind of costs were associated with that particular uh, incinerator in Crow Wing, is that something that can be replicated other places? Mr. Bank. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative, um, that could potentially be replicated. Um, we had the incinerator uh, in our possession, the DNR actually had it, uh, that we've been looking at it for the use in other uh, disease issues, um, and so it was available. And so we started talking with Crow Wing back in April about what the potential options were and work to get to that point. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Maybe we want to move into that now, because um, that's really where we kind of jumped in. Um, we were going to have an adopt dumpster program, and Crow Wing County was going to be the recipient of the waste, and they said, hold on here. We're not sure we want to take uh, infected carcasses into our landfill. And the reason for that are a couple. Um, you know, we looked at the research, and the research said uh, landfills with clay liners uh, who manage their leachate, uh, either at a wastewater treatment facility or, or some form like that, uh, it would work in. But in Crow Wing County situation, they take their leachate and they land apply it at the site to manage the leachate on site, reduces costs, but also can manage things uh, according to their landfill because they also take that leachate and recirculate it through the waste and drop out an additional metals and other problems that they have in the leachate back into the landfill where it was supposed to stay. So they've got a situation that didn't quite fit with the models that were out there from a research standpoint. So back in April, um, we took a look at forming a group. This is a real long answer, Representative Heinzman, but if you bear with me, it'll be like testimony, okay? <laughs> That's fun. The, knowing that we had some issues that were coming from a lot of different places, uh, the DNR uh, worked hard to pull a group together and we participated with that. Uh, Dr. Carstensen made sure we included everyone that we thought we needed at the table to get their perspectives. That included the DNR and the PCA, but it also included the Department of Ag, the Board of Animal Health, the Department of Health, and local meat processors, taxidermists. We invited small haulers. The landfill operators were key to this. Uh, the contracted engineer for them as well as the highway department. Because highway departments are picking up uh, roadkill all the time and how this was going to get managed. So that was an excellent you know, group to get together and it took a while to get to a proper solution. <clears throat> as we mentioned, getting the carcass disposed of properly is really the key to stopping the spread of the disease. If it's left on the landscape, it can be a, you know, a source of spreading that through scavengers but through other deer that come in contact with that soil or with that animal. There's no human health risk associated with landfilling and the only advisory with the material is not to consume uh, positive deer. 
But I'm not sure that there's anyone out there that would eat a sick animal, and that's kind of the same kind of rule of thumb that you would go by. So the testing can determine knowns and unknowns, uh, really, but the lag time makes it a little bit difficult to collect that exact deer. DNR will attempt to recover any confirmed deer. Uh, if you get one that's confirmed, Michelle will call you personally, and she'll find out where that carcass is and how you can recover that so that it can be taken up to the alkaline digester at the U of M where it can be assured that the you know, prions will be denatured and taken care of. But because of that delay, there's a risk that it might go into the waste stream and then potentially go into the landfill. And that's really what we were trying to get at. So we took a look at the research, and there's a lot out there, um, <clears throat> and we can provide you with anything that you may not already have uh, through the other testifiers. But we really looked at it from the risk standpoint at the landfill itself. As I mentioned, you know, with Crowing County, how it moves through the waste stream there was a little bit different than others. You know, they have the spray field for the leachate that they need to be worried about. So we looked at the research and we knew that we could slow it down with clay liners. But a lot of our liners at these landfills are composite liners, uh, don't necessarily have a layer of clay. So our um, advice to the landfill was if you're going to put the deer in the landfill that you place them above these recirculation lines so that there's not additional water going through it, that we put some appropriate base soil, according to the research, underneath the deer so that they can be, um, you know, above the uh, soils so that any prions migrating would bind up into that soils and then cover as soon as possible to avoid any additional rain coming through. That's all consistent with the research and it would work at the landfill. And so initially, uh, we were talking about that option. But as we got further down the line, the county really looked at the incinerator. And this is a picture of the incinerator. Uh, it's large, uh, kind of like the roll-off boxes in terms of size. Uh, it's about, uh, as I recall, about 50 cubic yards or a little bit bigger than that. But it's, it's a big box. So they fill it with wood. They get some accelerant in there, and then they fire it off, <laughs> let it get burning, and then they put the carcasses in there. That big blower on the front end is, is the air uh, curtain part of it. Uh, it actually blows additional air into there to increase the temperatures. There's a picture of me standing in there, and you'd only want to do that when it's off. Uh, <laughs> so, but you can kind of get the size of, of the facility as well. Once the ash is the re result of that burn, would replace that into the landfill. So. You can see where they want to put that. That's just at the top of the landfill in an area that they're going to recover shortly. So that ash, even that ash, has a very low risk uh, in terms of any prions being in it, but its placement is key to reduce any migration. The other thing that I talked about before was the spray application site. They decided to take an extra step and defense off that field so deer couldn't get in there. As you can imagine, that's the first place to green up in the springtime, and it does attract a lot of deer. And so just reducing the risk uh, further by fencing that off is what Crowing did. Thanks to the Crowing County landfill. Senator oh, Thomasoni, but we actually had Representative Heinzman had a follow-up before Senator Thomasoni. So. Okay. I'll quickly do that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Rep. Rabin and, actually, and, and, and I were actually talking a little bit about this, and he wanted to be here today. Um, but the, uh, the governor is in his district, so I'll kind of give you the gist of what we're wondering. So I have had some knowledge of this facility at Crowing that's being created. Um, the question kind of centers around what are we incinerating? And uh, it's maybe a science question, but somebody here probably could answer it for us. Um, obviously, when a deer is taken in the field, part of that deer remains in the field, the entrails and such, right? Um, when we bring a carcass to a landfill, like what we're talking about. I'm assuming every bit of that carcass is being incinerated, uh, which I think sounds like a very logical solution. But of course, there's still material that's being left in the field. Um, I, I think it obviously sounds like it makes sense that we're destroying everything that we have after the deer is processed. OK, that, that's great. but. Uh, well, is there anybody that can kind of give us an idea what the danger is of the material left at the 
site of the kill. Dr. Carstensen. Representative, yeah, I mean, so we're, we're talking really about what's the risk of gut piles on the right. landscape. And so when we think about risk, let's look at Crow Wing County where we've tested 9,000 deer in two falls and didn't find any detections, yet we had one sick animal uh, discovered. Um, I think the risk for gut piles is extremely small. And so when it comes to an animal that most of our deer that have been harvested that are positive of the 53, we've had three that actually looked sick. They were found dead or looked emaciated. Most of these look perfect. They look like a deer anybody would want to take home and consume. And so the, they have the disease, but it's at the early stage. And so the prions aren't likely distributed uniformly through the body, and they're more concentrated in brain spine, eyes, that kind of stuff. And so the entrails are probably less contaminated than any other part of the carcass at that early stage. So the risk is just slight. And when we're trying to manage this disease at the scale that we are, you know, we also have to be realistic about what we can ask hunters to do. You know, to try to remove gut piles at the same time that they're dragging out their deer, I think is a lot to ask. And it's really a very small piece of the risk of this situation. So the higher risk is really the spine, brain, and that's what we're focused on. Senator Thomas Honey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, Mr. Benke, I think I, I think I heard you say that there's a low risk of the prions being in the ash after incineration. And does that mean that the incineration <laughs> might not kill the prions? The, uh, I think as we looked at the risk, uh, if there were to be prions left, and we don't have a good test to confirm or not confirm that right now, and so we took that extra step and said, let's make sure that the ash doesn't present any further risk. Rather than disposing of it uh, outside of a line landfill or on the land, which was part of our discussion, we wanted to put it back into the landfill to make sure that it didn't move any further. So we can't confirm that, that there is no more prions in there, but we just wanted to make sure that we reduced the risk, and the best way to reduce that was to put it in the, in the landfill. And Senator Thomasoni, Chairman, just to follow up on um, Representative Heinzman's question, so do the do the gut piles not have any prions in them, and is is that not a way to transmit? Is that what we're is that what I'm hearing, Dr. Carson? Mr. Chair, um, we feel that's low risk. So whether or not the the gut pile might have prions, I think in a clinical animal that's really um, sick with the disease, emaciated, has all the clinical signs, it's likely throughout the body of that animal. Um, but in these cases that we mostly see, which are hunter harvested animals, uh, the risk is really low that the gut pile is also contaminated because the deer are in such an early phase of the disease. The prions are more likely distributed through the nervous system and the gut pile becomes less of a source. Not zero risk, but less risk when we're talking about managing risk. Senator Herr and then Representative Wagenius. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, testifier, I am I, um, going to jump the question a little bit. I, I know it's a little confusing um, about the track, the hauler and all that, but uh, my, my question is slightly different. I'm going to look at the perspective of the hunters, you know, because open season is com coming up. And uh, what, are, what are we going to do in terms of uninformed hunters, you know, and even hunters that I represent, which, um, you know, um, English is their second language, and how, how are we going to deal with that? Would they be penalized if they're not able to uh, comply with the procedure that we have here? Dr. Karstensen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representatives, um, <coughs> the um, information that's in our hunting regulations book, um, I believe has also been translated to the Southeast Asian community, and I know there's been some specific outreach um, uh, to that community about rules and regulations that have changed this year, particularly about mandatory testing and carcass movement restrictions. Um, so I think the, um, there's been some effort on the outreach to make sure uh, all the communities can understand the rules. And so uh, I hope that uh, we have done that outreach um, and that it's, it is clear to hunters what the rules are. And when they do um, come to the check station and interact with us, that's another opportunity for us to explain, uh, Hunter, what's your plan? Do you know that there's carcass movement restrictions in place? You know, have you thought about your options? We can also guide them to meat processors and taxidermists in the zone. We can show them where the dumpsters and quartering stations should be uh, and provide uh, options for them to, uh, to still enjoy their, their uh, harvest and comply with the rules. So that does happen one-on-one -on -one at the stations too. And we've had really good compliance 
Um, in the past years in Preston, where we've had carcass movement restrictions, our compliance has been in the high 90%. And so I think the hunters are, are getting it and, and doing their part, and uh, we've had really good interactions. Okay. Yeah, well, th yeah, thank you, ma'am. Ma ma um, I thank you for the, for the answer. I, I kind of asked you this question because I have to leave the community here real soon, so I, I won't be able to hear further. But, you know, I hope that we will find a solution for the um, haulers uh, later on in time. And so thank you for very much for your response. And if I can be a resource to the DNR or how we can relate more information uh, across the board, I, I'll be available for that as well. Thank you. Representative Wiginius. Thank you. I, Mr. Pankey, I, I appreciate the focus on Crow Wing, uh, but there's a whole bunch of the rest of the state. And I, I, I just want to check what you said at the beginning of your testimony when you were talking about leachate being managed from uh, landfills. You talked about spraying it if it's going on the land, but I thought I heard you say if the leachate is going to a wastewater treatment system, then it's fine. Is that true? Is, did I hear that right? Mr. Benke. Madam Chair, um, when we talked about the, well, I'll get to that in a second. When we talked about the leachate, um, we were really talking about <laughs> two separate uh, types of landfills in terms of their uh, set up. With Crow Wing County, they take the leachate, they recirculate it through the facility, and then they um, spray it on the land. And so the concerns from Crow Wing County were how it moves out through the system. In the discussions with other counties, the other options will be to set up a cell within a cell, so to speak, with the clay liner underneath the animal mass with the right soils to bind any prions that might escape from that into that soil. And because we don't have um, the same type of uh, clay liners that were done in some of the research, uh, the suggestion is to put the clay in the landfill uh, because it's not there. That sets up the situation then that it won't show up in the leachate uh, through the research, and then it's procedure to procedure or its movement to the wastewater treatment facility is the low risk that uh, we've been talking about with this. If I could follow up. Representative Wiginius. I mean, you are giving us a theory, and I'm talking about the practicality right now, tomorrow. Right. So, so we don't have, we don't require landfills to set up certain things. Do they even know about the, this that you're talking about? I am assuming people right now will be putting their carcasses in a landfill that is a composite line, not lay line, and that you're saying it's okay that that leachate goes to the wastewater treatment system. Is that correct? Matt, Mr. Chair and members, that is correct. The uh, leachate that goes through that, uh, in most cases, isn't coming from uh, areas that are infected, you know, in terms of a surveillance uh, level. There's a potential that those facilities have uh, receive deer regardless of what's going on now over time. And looking at the research that's out there, they haven't been able to find prions in leachate, uh, but the testing is limited. So it's not a perfect test yet. But <clears throat> what we're concentrating on is those landfills who are receiving waste from the DNR surveillance areas as the highest risk, the most potential for prions to be in that waste stream even though very limited from that standpoint, as Dr. Carsonson mentioned, there's only a handful of deer that have gone in there, but it could have happened outside of this surveillance. Someone could have shot a deer, not had it tested, it went in the garbage, got to the landfill. So we're trying to make sure that if we know uh, deer are coming in, uh, that we add extra precautions uh, to that. Mr. Chair, I, I, I still feel that I'm not getting a good response here. You've concentrated on Crow Wing County. I get Crow Wing County. But in southern Minnesota, there's this whole area. Is every line, landfill there lined with, with clay? Or are some of them composite lined? What's, what's practically going on right this minute? <coughs> sure, and I'll jump, jump to that, because we have talked to other landfills about this. Um, 
And one of the things that we have made sure we uh, started to do is once we started working with Crow Wing County, we thought it would probably never, you know, not specifically end there in terms of discussion. So we added additional landfills to the discussion. We talked at the Solid Waste Administrators meeting uh, this fall, presented there. Dr. Carsonson presented, and we talked about the disposal parts. We've met with the Minnesota Resource Recovery Association to see how they could participate in potentially managing the deer waste. Um, but the uh, situation in Olmsted County was the county was accepting them at their landfill. Um, and then we needed to make sure that they were uh, on board with that. We recently went down and had a meeting with their environmental uh, committee uh, to the board. And they, got, they gave a unanimous uh, just, you know, recommendation to the county board to continue to accept those, but to add those additional precautions that we talked about. That's, that's prompted a discussion with the Rochester Wastewater uh, Treatment Facility to make sure that they're comfortable with the risk. The Wastewater Treatment Facility won't uh, treat the prion. That system's not set up to, to treat that. Okay, Mr. We are hearing so much about the process. Yep. <laughs> There's a season <coughs> in days, and I'm trying to get to outcomes. And I want to know about the outcomes. Olmsted and Crow Wing are only two counties in areas where we have potential risk or higher risk. So it's, it's so hard to hear from your testimony what the outcome is tomorrow or the next week. Um, so now I'm hearing it's not safe to put leachate from a composite line landfill into a wastewater treatment system in an area where um, there is risk. Mr. Benke. Mr. Chair, uh, it was a little hard to hear your question out of that, but the work that we've concentrated on has been with those facilities that are accepting uh, the waste from the adopted dumpster programs. Those are in the surveillance areas designed to collect any in impacted animals in there. So the other landfills that we've talked to in this state, uh, in addition to um, Crow Wing, we had St. Louis County in on our conversation. We've talked to Morrison County, which are you know neighboring counties that um, may have concerns. They're still accepting wastes that come into their landfills um, because they recognize that the disease hasn't been found in their areas. Um, and if it is, then we'll have a further discussion about how we can keep reducing that risk. Now, in terms of Olmsted County, I did mention the concerns were raised to the board and we're working through the Environmental Committee and the board uh, to come to resolution on their acceptance. In the meantime, other landfills that we've spoken to for disposal uh, in state and out of state uh, are available to take this. And they've looked at the science and at the research as well in terms of accepting it and continue to accept it. One of those is in La Crosse. Um, and of course, they have uh, impacted areas and counties as well that they service. Representative Guineas. I am just hearing two counties. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Wagenius, could you please use the microphone sure. so Thank that we you. could hear? I Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm hearing two counties that are ready, growing, Olmsted. But we have more counties where the risk is higher, and I'm not hearing preparations there. And that's um, because we're hearing process and not outcomes. And it's scary to me. I think the question is what is happening in the other counties? What if we get a positive deer in another area um, or more than one? Mr. Chair and, and members, uh, the other counties that are in the surveillance area in the southeast aren't operating landfills. They don't have a disposal site in their county and therefore they're using other counties um, in terms of their you know, MSW disposal, their mixed solid waste. So in southeast, that includes Wabasha and Houston counties are taking waste over to La Crosse. Uh, in the Fillmore County area, I believe they use uh, landfills that are connected in Iowa uh, or elsewhere. Um, so that's where 
you know, we haven't worked with them. They don't have a, a landfill necessarily in their uh, counties. Representative Sandell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've mentioned uh, uh, recently um, uh, work in, in both Iowa and Wisconsin. I wonder how extensive has been your cooperation with the counties uh, that are contiguous with those in the southeastern Minnesota um, and the disposal and um, um, for um, CWD in, in Wisconsin and uh, Iowa. Could you be more specific about that, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, we haven't had uh, direct conversations with uh, Iowa folks. Um, most of the conversations have been centered around uh, if we've got a collection site and it's going to a location and that location has concern. And so um, the Olmsted County examples, we're working through that. Um, we have a call in to uh, Iowa in terms of discussion further. Um, we've had back and forth over different disease outbreaks in the past with the high path avian influenza. Work closely with Iowa uh, in terms of the disposal of uh, turkeys and chickens. Um, and that was a cooperative effort in terms of knowing where and, and what would be available. Um, so there's, uh, I think, an ongoing conversation that we've had, but not specifically uh, if they haven't raised any issues with disposal at this time. Um, that's where we've kind of uh, moved to. Our biggest issue right now, as Brian talked about, was uh, the contracts just to move the waste to a facility. And that's what we're really struggling with right now. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Rep Representative Lee, and then we're going to go, we'll be done with that section, and then we'll go to Dr. Carstensen because we will have to keep moving. So, Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's kind of Building on what Senator Hur and Representative Guillens was saying around the what's happening outside of just the surveillance zone down there, we understand that there are hunters from throughout the state that do go down there. And so what is the preparation or the discussion around what's happening, you know, in the county that I represent, Hennepin County or other counties throughout the state? What if a deer was transported outside of the zone and comes into different counties? What's going to happen there? Mr. Chair, representatives, um, well, hopefully the hunters are aware of the carcass movement restrictions that are in place, and that doesn't happen, that scenario that you explained. Um, so I do contact a hunter as soon as we have a suspect and ask right away, where did the carcass remains go? And so if we had a situation, as you described, that it was brought back illegally into, say, the metro area, um, I would want to know where their carcass went. It's possible it would have gone into the local waste stream in the cities. I'm not sure. That has happened once before. Um, but we would make an effort to recover if we could. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't currently have any sort of um, mechanisms in place for conversations, as Mr. Benke talked about, with these other counties outside of our area because they're just low risk right now for disease. And we're focusing on areas where they have the disease to manage and, and where the risk is. Um, and so I hope that the hunters follow the restrictions and don't transport outside of the zone, but I'd certainly be contacting them if they were doing that and, and if they did have a suspect here to try to recover it. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a quick comment. I feel like that's, that's very concerning if we don't have a plan for that right now that there are tra some transport that are coming into the metro area or throughout other parts of the state that's not part of the surveillance and what if that impacts, you know, our solid waste management for the different paths that we have and how, how is that going to impact you know the public health of the, the communities that are going to be there when an illegal transport is there. Mr. Chair, members, the biggest risk that's been associated with this would be potentially eating the <coughs> contaminated animal. Uh, the disposal has been not, not linked to spread of the disease at all, especially in the landfill. Um, you know, and I think that's where we're really concentrating and making sure it gets there. So if it does come back into the metro area in Hennepin County, that goes to the incinerator in Minneapolis where it's managed that way. And so the, you know, the butcher remains once you get to that point would be small and, and managed through the, the waste stream. Other line landfills, like I said, um, they're managing waste. And when you build a landfill, there's another component that uh, helps encapsulate any of the prions that might be in there if, if they were. And that is we put a layer of soil over every layer of waste that goes in there. So if you think about a waste 
landfill being built up, there's six inches of soil put on every single day that would capture any migrating prions uh, if they were in that landfill going through. So that, this is really continuing to reduce the risk, uh, and that's what this is all about. Prevention is the key to making this happen. Getting any contaminated animals off the landscape where their risk is highest, getting them into proper disposal uh, so they're managed and reducing the risk. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just do want to mention that I have been in contact with Pennebent County around the incinerator, which is just south of my district, and they have said that the incinerator there will not be able to uh, destroy the prion. Representative Green, were you on disposal, or did you have a larger question? I, Mr. Chair, I have a completely different question. I just wanted to get to the DNR before they leave, but the question will also affect the other three, uh, uh, the university and the Department of Ag. And so in the interest of time, I was hoping I could ask the question, and instead of having them come down, maybe they could address it when they do come down. Dr. Carsonson has a presentation right after this, so she's not leaving. Okay. <laughs> so I think it, you might get it. If we move right to Dr. Carstensen, or that that sounds all right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're getting set up. I think it would be helpful um, for both the PCA and the DNR when news happens on whether or not you get a contract with a, a hauler or a landfill uh, on addressing this problem in the next few days. It would be helpful to get that to the committee so that we can inform our constituents of what's happening. Dr. Carson. Representative Hansen, members. Um, so I'm going to provide a, an update um, about our surveillance and management, implementation of rules and regulations for this fall, uh, talk about funding, uh, some of the items that were brought up um, for us to cover. Um, I'll really briefly um, talk about chronic waste and disease itself, and I wanted to, to really um, just emphasize, you know, this idea about uh, the deer that we're harvesting look a lot like the top photo. So these are both animals that are positive, but the, almost all but three of the animals that we've harvested look just like that adult male in good shape. And we don't really see a lot of these clinical cases in our, our harvested animals, but we have found three uh, that look um, much more similar like the clinical signs on the bottom. And, you know, um, Dr. Larson is going to be talking probably more about uh, prion agent, um, but I just wanted to also point out about uh, how difficult it is to denature this, which is why we were talking about incineration as an improved method over 1,500 degrees. And normal disinfectants as bleach don't destroy the prions, but as Dr. Larson pointed out, new research just came out that talked about surface cleaning, which I think gets at our meat processing industry that uh, was brought up earlier, that 40% uh, bleach solution uh, where, uh, where like tools, uh, a hunter's knife uh, that was used to, to cut up the animal, if it sits for five minutes, that showed that it was able to denature the prions. So I think we have some new hope when it comes to surface cleaning anyway, uh, that might help our meat processing industry, but certainly an individual hunter should have a better sense of, um, of, uh, of cleaning tools anyway with this, this tool now out there. And we do know that where this disease exists, it's not okay. We know it's 100% fatal. We know that uh, deer that are infected but not symptomatic have higher mortality rates. We focus on adult bucks, adult males, because they're three times more likely to have the disease, and yearling males are delivery systems. And that it is having a negative effect long term in populations when infection is really high. And everything we're doing in Minnesota is really trying to avoid what's happened in our neighbor state, uh, not to pick on Wisconsin, whereas which I'm actually from, a dairy farm. Um, but, you know, we've had uh, um, the ability to watch what's been going on there, and it's been increasing in prevalence um, for two decades. Now in that four-county area, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have over 55% prevalence in adult males and over 30% prevalence in adult females. Um, and so this disease has moved uh, across the state. It's in two-thirds of all counties um, and with really high prevalences in the south. Um, 
I showed the slide earlier about where we have disease coming into this fall, and I'll have an update here at the end for the last couple of cases. But most of the infection, again, is southeast Minnesota, in Fillmore, Houston, and Winona counties. And our prevalence in what was 603, which is now 3, uh, sorry, 647, 648, started out at 6 tenths of a percent. And I want you to think about that number for a second because we just looked at the Wisconsin slide with 55%. And so I often have to describe the differences between our states, but we are markedly different than Wisconsin. And we want to be, okay? This is something we want to be different in, and that our prevalences are nowhere near what they're now experiencing. And so when we first found the disease, it was six-tenths of 1% one, one, uh, prevalence. You know, in this most recent fall, we've had a bit of an uptick to uh, eight-tenths, nine-tenths of a percent, but we're still in the very early stages of this disease in Minnesota. Um, and, and so we also updated our management plan, uh, response plan, uh, that's available on the website. But we took all the information that we've been learning uh, from uh, the, the, the research and disease management across the nation and, uh, and updated our plan this last year. It went out for public comment. And basically we have these phases we're talking about in the plan, which describes initial detection, that early phase, the honeymoon phase, for lack of a better term, which is where we're at with Crow Wing County right now. One detection, we're not sure what we have, it's really early in the in disease invasion. And then we have some metrics we describe in the plan to, to understand when is it that we go into a different phase, into a persistent infection. And that's where we are right now in Fillmore County. And we also identified some triggers for when we have endemic disease. And each of those phases are laid out in a way that we can think about how to invest our resources and what tools make sense to use when we're in these different areas. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not guns a-blazing for every scenario. If you found the disease for the very first time, like Tennessee did just recently, at over 20% in the first county they just looked at, some of those tools are not applicable anymore to them. They're too far into the disease to think about eradicating the disease. And so we laid this out in a way that makes sense for Minnesota, but applies to other you know, disease scenarios. And it's really about investing our resources wisely, using the science we know about this disease, and trying to have the best outcomes. So all of this information formulated the plan we laid out now for this fall. We took the locations of where we found the disease. In this map, you can see a 15-mile buffer around all the known areas in Minnesota. We've also looked at Wisconsin and northern Iowa, where they have their disease, and we drew lines around them. And it turns out pretty much most of southeast Minnesota is in this area of risk, and, uh, and that's what we focused on. But it's one thing to have the science and to read the papers and communicate <coughs> that, but we also have to have the hunters and the landowners understand what we're trying to communicate and be willing partners in fighting this disease together. So there has been some recent human dimensions work where surveys were sent out to landowners and hunters in southeast Minnesota, kind of gauging what they think about CWD, what they think about certain rules and regulations to see what kind of buy-in we could have because without that buy-in, we won't be successful. <laughs> and just a couple slides to talk about that. So this slide shows CWD regulations should is the question. And on the left side, it has disagree. On the right side, it has agree. So we had strong agreement that our landowners and hunters think CWD regulations should be designed to limit disease spread. They don't want to impact hunter participation. They don't want to impact the local economy. And they're OK being aggressive in the short term. They, they, do de they definitely were not interested in providing any financial incentives to hunters. They don't want to be passive and let nature take its course. Um, so we think about that feeling and then what kind of regulations would you support to try to accomplish these goals and we had strong agreement for venison donation programs they like the idea of, of uh, utilizing the end products banning recreational feeding to get at minimizing uh, congregations of deer and transmission taking one buck a season prohibiting carcass exports so there was agreement with that um, but there was disagreement with things like earn a buck taking one doe before a buck or professional culling and those two tools alone are extremely effective at disease management, um, but it has little support from the public. Taking a dough before a buck and that sort. sort. And so we, you know, we think about those things when we implement our disease um, management plans, but we also think about the deer themselves. And that's why we have a study going on in South Min Min Southeast Minnesota looking at how deer move on the landscape. And this project um, was really aimed at dispersing deer. So we're thinking about these young deer uh, when they're leaving their natal range and moving to where they're going to establish a new home range and that they might be moving disease with them. And we wanted to understand how far they might go and how that might impact the size of these zones that we're setting up and thinking about managing disease on the landscape. And so um, we have um, 
collar deer on the air, we started in uh, two winters ago. Um, so far, we've also been documenting mortalities. We've had 47 mortalities of collar deer. Um, the majority of these have been hunter harvested. And uh, we also had, in year one, a lot of activity, uh, collar failure problems um, that uh, was with the manufacturer, unfortunately. A lot of that first batch had a hardware failure um, and uh, um, was very unfortunate to have that much um, failed collars. But the company did replace uh, all the collars uh, under their warranty, but it didn't replace the costs of catching those animals and putting that collar out to begin with. Um, so we have made some uh, strides with the manufacturer to deal with that. Uh, the second deployment of collars, which happened last winter, was much better. We've only had, I think, two collar failures out of that cohort. And so uh, I think they've addressed some of those um, uh, problems that they have in quality control. And we're currently actively monitoring 61 deer as of now. And so just a few preliminary results, thinking about how these deer move on the landscape. You know, I have a slide here that talks about this last spring. You know, we have about both sexes are, are moving. Um, interesting, in the first year, we had juvenile females uh, move farther than the juvenile males. And in the, you know, the white-tailed deer literature, you think about yearling males as the dispersers. But we're seeing females move, too, um, and some of them quite some distances. I have a slide here that just shows the average home ranges and then some of these dispersal distances, which are really about uh, 10 to 12 kilometers on average. But we have had some really extreme outliers. We've had a female juvenile disperse 77 miles from pretty much Harmony to Cannon Falls. We've also had a yearly male this last year go 54 miles. So there's some potential for outliers where these animals can move long distances. And, uh, and this coming winter, we're planning to co collar some more deer. We have uh, 90 collars ordered uh, to try to keep the study going and capture more yearling ver uh, year and year variation and uh, hopefully learn more about dispersal. And then as these animals are are uh, aging and uh, the collars are staying on. We're learning more too about uh, the size of the home ranges when they're adults um, and to uh, basically maximize the ability to get as much as we can from the collars. Okay, so just moving into what we have on deck for this fall um, in the regulations book, there's a lot on this slide, but bottom line is we're implementing our plan. So we took that new plan and we implemented it into action, considering what hunters and landowners gave us as feedback through the surveys. So we have a lot of hunting opportunity. We have early analyst seasons. We have disease management tags uh, that are available at an unlimited bag at $2.50 a piece. In the southeast, where we're managing a persistent infection, we have three legal bucks per year. So this is a new change. So it's a buck a season. It's a buck for archery, a buck for firearm, and a buck for muzzleloader. We do not have that multiple buck option in 604 in the north central. And that's because that's still in that early phase. So we didn't need to be as aggressive with those adult males. APR has been removed in both in the southeast and all areas in our zone. And we have carcass movement restrictions in place in all of our CWD management zones. That includes fawns. Uh, but the testing is mandatory for adults, uh, one and older. The fawn testing is really optional uh, for, for the hunters. And we have a new thing this year, too, called the control zone. That's the area in yellow. And that's kind of a buffer is what that's meant to be. So it has higher level of testing. It also has movement restrictions for the carcasses, but it isn't as intense as the zone itself. It's to try to catch the disease before it moves outside to protect greater Minnesota. And uh, in 604, these, as, as I mentioned, regulations are somewhat similar, except for the multiple buck is not in place there. There's just one, one male per licensed hunter. Um, and they also have that um, additional harvest opportunities, early antlers season, uh, unlimited disease management tags, mandatory testing. And so these zones are in place. All this information is in the regulations book. We also expanded our recreational feeding ban to include basically all counties, including and surrounding where the disease is known to occur. And for both the north central and the southeast, this ban does include attractants, so the use of attractants. Um, and, uh, and so that's really trying to get at uh, not encouraging deer to the same mock scrapes that you create as a hunter. Um, in our central area, where we're in our third year precautionary testing around Meeker County, there the attractants are, all, are allowed because we have not found disease in the wild there. This is our third and potentially final year of doing surveillance in that area. Um, this slide shows a, a picture of what the self-service sampling uh, kiosks look like. So these are in place in about uh, 16 places in southeast Minnesota and six in north central Minnesota currently. Uh, that's our mechanism for obtaining samples through the archery season, and it will be back out for a muzzleloader. Um, and so we pick up samples every other day, and we ship three times a week to the lab. 
Um, and during the firearm season, all these stations will be staffed by DNR and veterinary students on the weekends, but DNR the whole week. Um, so it gives us that chance, again, to interact with the majority of hunters, have conversations about what they're doing with their deer, do they understand the rules, do they have any questions, and, and be able to communicate that valuable information. And we do have uh, quartering stations and hopefully more dumpsters available. Um, just a quick note about testing. Um, we do take retropharyngeal lymph nodes, and the lab we ship to is in Colorado. And so it takes, on average, four business days when, uh, when the shipments are, are not so, uh, so large, like right through archery. Opening weekend, when we're shipping you know, 10,000 samples uh, to the lab, that's going to be a little bit slower. So that'll probably take twice that, more like eight days. And so the hold times for hunters from opening weekend is going to be longer than during the slower parts of the season. And that's just due to the capacity at the lab. Um, when a deer is, uh, um, if it tests positive on the first test, that's when I reach out to the hunter. And it takes about uh, seven days for the second confirmatory test to come through. That's immunohistochemistry. Dr. Carson, I think we have yes. a question on this point. Uh, yes. Representative Becker Finn and Representative Green, I'll, I'll go to you after that if, if yours is coming up. Or. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so earlier in this presentation, you talked about how important it is that we catch this early if we stand a chance to do anything with management practices. I'm wondering um, what the options are for uh, other hunters outside of the CWD sampling station zones to have their deer tested. Mr. Chair, representatives, um, there are options for those hunters. It's available on our website that, that uh, basically provides instructions for how a hunter anywhere in the state um, can uh, take samples on their own. We made a video for how to collect samples. We also have the link in there for the Diagnostic Lab at the University of Minnesota and the, the Colorado Lab for how they can fill out the form and submit samples. Um, they can either drop off sa or submit samples or the whole head for the Diagnostic Lab here and have uh, samples collected on their own, but DNR is not uh, paying for those testing outside of our zones or facilitating that directly. We're just providing the information for how hunters can participate if they would like to. Representative becker uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I had seen that on the website, and it's um, very convoluted and complicated, and I, I think we need to try to do something better than that because it essentially says that I'm supposed to cut off the head of my deer. So I hunt up north um, in 197 or 184, which is near, just north of the crowing zone. Um, and so essentially it says that I can cut the head off of my deer, pack it in a uh, refrigerated box, and then mail it to the U of M or drop it off. But if I drop it off and it's not in between eight and four, it's going to cost me an, another $35. And the total cost is going to be essentially double. It's almost $100. So then I'm transporting a carcass from the Cass Lake Bemidji area to Minneapolis. I don't think that's feasible. <laughs> Um, I know there's a video about finding the lymph nodes and a way to do that, but again, it's still going to cost almost $100. And I'm wondering if there's a way at least at these um, stations, I mean, has there been consideration of where we have these stations set up? You know, Pine River is, I don't know, half an hour from where I hunt, and many other people are, I'm sure, within a reasonable distance of some of these other zones. Um, I know I would be willing to pay something to give the DNR that extra information. I would think the more samples we have statewide, the better off we would be. Dr. Carstensen. Representative Hansen, members, it really circles back to risk and how to invest those resources is the slide I had. And, and so I think, you know, the, the, every individual hunter can perceive what risk is for themselves. Certainly, if you came to Pine River uh, during a, our sampling window and uh, DNR staff were available there, they would help you find the lymph nodes and offer you that service. But the testing and the, the process for paying for that is outside of the scope of where we're investing those resources. And honestly, uh, it's really not going to be that informative to have two samples, let's just say, in one permit area. Um, you know, if we're going to do surveillance in a new area, we want to have a statistically representative sample to try to infer if we have disease there. And so uh, that opportunity for individuals to participate on their own exists. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we might be able to try to work on the, the language on the website and try to clarify that, that. But it's really about investing the resources we have. I'll be getting to a slide that talks about the money we're spending now. And I think just accommodating all of that um, is outside the scope of the resources we currently have and the staffing to support that as well. Representative Beckerfin. Uh, this will be my final question. And I guess so that the answer is no, we haven't looked into um, making that easier for folks. And, you know, I've gotten phone calls from various people, both in the metro area and outside the metro area, saying, you know, I got some venison from my cousin. Is it okay to, to feed that to my kids? You know, and then having to like go through, well, where did it come from? You know, where did they shoot it? All, all those kinds of questions. And I think um, as far as the, the resources that we have, if it spreads further and we don't catch it, we're looking at a billion dollar industry being impacted. And, you know, those small businesses in Northern Minnesota and rural, uh, throughout rural Minnesota being impacted. Um, if you need more money, then we need to hear that you need more money, but to not choose to make things easier for hunters ahead of the game before even asking for the funds is, I think, um, I think we need to shift the way we think about this problem if we really stand any chance of not turning into Wisconsin. I know that uh, Congresswoman McCollum held a hearing two weeks ago uh, regarding CWD, and there is... Uh, People are paying attention to this, you know, throughout the country. So I think there there may be options for funding. But if you never ask for the funding because you kind of short circuit the plan ahead of time, that um, that doesn't put us in a good spot to try to make sure people are eating safe venison and feel good about hunting. Dr. Carson, uh, Representative Finn. Um, one thing, too, to, to point out is this isn't a food safety test that we're doing. It's only looking for the presence of prions if it's detectable in that animal at any point in time. And so that's why it's never negative. It's just not detected. So an animal can have chronic wasting disease in the early stages and not be detected in these tests. And so it's not a food safety test. And, uh, you know, the, the, again, it's, it's really about risk and these areas outside of where we are looking for the disease based on the risk factors in our plan, which focus on positive cervid farms, doing surveillance around where there are, finding deer that are symptomatic, we test across the state where they are thin or have neurologic symptoms, or our neighbor states where there's disease encroachment towards our borders. We also are doing surveillance there as part of our precautionary testing. We don't test every deer harvested across the state or provide that service to hunters now. And I think if that's a direction that uh, uh, the group wants us to go to in the future, we'll have to talk about how that could even possibly happen logistically and funding wise. Represent back. Yeah, real quick, sorry. I just, um, people eat the deer. And I don't want Minnesotans to be worried about the safety of the deer. And so I, if we stand any chance of stopping this disease, we need to do a better job of not stopping it where our, you know, well, my jurisdiction line stops here. I'm not going to think through the whole process because I'm a deer hunter and I'm a mom and I want to feel good about feeding my kids a good lean protein and this, you know, the same thing, you know, we talk about our hunting traditions and our right to hunt. It's not a right to kill. It's a right to hunt, which I think includes the right to be able to eat the animals that are harvested. And so, um, this isn't necessarily saying, well, that's my agenda to move in that direction. I mean, that's what we're hearing from the public. I don't want people to be afraid to eat venison. If we're worried about our hunter numbers, people being afraid to eat the venison is not going to be helpful at all. And so we need to think further into that parent that's deciding whether they're going to hunt this year and feed that to their kids. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Once again, in the interest of time, uh, Doctor, would you grab your pen? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and, and maybe you can answer them uh, in the order they come in, or maybe maybe they're even on your slides. Okay, first of all, uh, there's been some research out of Pennsylvania and Louisiana that is suggesting that the, this disease may be uh, uh, not prion at all, but maybe bacterial, and that the bacteria is actually affecting the prions, and that's why we're getting the readings on the prions. Uh, so the question is, are you following that research or have you looked into that or do you intend to look into that? Because if we're going down the wrong path, 
it would be nice to know. And uh, apparently there's a, a couple of uh, doctors in both Pennsylvania and Louisiana who are looking into that. The other, the other one is uh, there, we heard last year and continue to hear that there is ways to do live testing. And have you looked into the live testing? If you're gonna be collaring this many deer in these areas and there is a way to do live testing, wouldn't it stand to reason that it would be much cheaper and, uh, and maybe way more beneficial than waiting till we have to kill off uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of animals to find these diseases? So are you looking into that? Is that, is that part of your, your uh, plan going forward? And the last question comes from people in my district who are wondering if they're still paying on their license for feeding deer through the DNR when they can no longer feed deer and the DNR won't feed them. Dr. Carstensen. Madam Chair, Representatives. Um, question one refer references uh, the Dr. Bastion work out of Louisiana. Um, and so perhaps Dr. Larson has that in his upcoming talk, but I'll just mention briefly that the work of Dr. Bastion um, has not been substantiated by anybody else who's tried to replicate his results, which is a very cornerstone of science. Um, he's no longer affiliated with Louisiana University. They distanced himself as fast as they could. And so I don't think there's really any uh, science in what he's done. At least it's not reproducible. So there really isn't any effort to uh, follow down that course at this time. Um, about live testing, um, and so part of the collaboration we're doing with the University of Minnesota and Dr. Larson is looking at his rapid test. We've been providing samples to help validate um, that testing that he's working on to give us a quicker turnaround to really address not just uh, live animals, but also faster postmortem tests, uh, postmortem tests, which would be awesome as far as trying to take animals out of the waste stream. So we're trying to contribute to that research. We don't do that research ourselves. But when it came to uh, whether or not we should test the animals that we're collaring, um, the live animal tests aren't that good. They're about 50% accurate. So usually it's a rectal mucosa test. And so you, if you pick it up at the time that they're shedding, you can be sure it's positive, but you don't know what you're missing if they're not shedding at the time. It's also quite invasive, which would require drugging those animals. And we were really just looking at trying to understand movement ecology. So the capture methods involved uh, net gunning. Um, the animals are just physically restrained for a few moments. The collar's put on, some ear tags, a genetic sample's taken, and they're released. So the handling time is quite short, and it didn't really facilitate you know, that type of a, of a handling scheme. And the third question was about, oh, I lost that one. Deer feeding. Uh, Deer feeding, uh, sure. Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, there still is a wild servant health account, which funds uh, uh, our, um, a lot of the work we do um, in wild servant health that I, I help work in. Um, so that's 50 cents of every deer license goes into that fund. And so there is, that's still a pro that appropriation language still talks about emergency deer feeding, but it's also wild servant health. And so a lot of those funds are spent on the work that we do, chronic waste and disease, EHD, neonicotinoids, things like that. So it's not uh, necessarily earmarked and held for emergency feeding. Um, there has been some times when that's been used in the past, uh, but not, uh, not recently. Uh, but those funds are used to monitor and study the health of our wild servants, moose, elk, uh, we do surveillance on both of those species, and that's funded from that account. Representative Green. Well, then, just, just thank you for those answers. That was very helpful. But one follow-up question. As I understand it, uh, um, Dr. Bastian is continuing with his work. Mm -hmm. And uh, should, should, he, you know, should he be uh, found to be right in this, or, or if he starts to make advances... I think it would be beneficial to at least keep an eye on what he's doing, <coughs> because if, if this is the case, uh, it would be, uh, you know, we've had this disease now since the 60s, and apparently no breakthroughs other than more and more testing and, and more uh, money being poured into it, that it wouldn't probably hurt to at least keep an eye on what he's doing and say, you know, if there is anything there, let's, uh, let's go down that road as well. I see Dr. Larson wants to comment. I'll ask him to hold, though, until his presentation. Um, members, we're going to keep going uh, past 12. Uh, I think that there's a lot of content here. I know people have other, but I do want to make sure that we're continuing to get uh, questions answered. And so for the testifiers that are still on deck, we still want the presentations. So, And anyone in the public, again, who would like to testify, uh, to contact the pages. Uh, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just going back to the, what's left in the field, the gut piles. Um, the prions are excreted in feces and urine, right? 
So are they excreted in the preclinical stage? Mm -hmm. So wh why are we so confident that the gut piles are safe? It's, uh, Mr. Chair, representatives, um, it's, it's about, again, risk. So safe in a clinical animal, I would say that the gut pile probably has prions as well, right? So in a preclinical animal, uh, they've shown to be shedding prions as early as four months, you know, when they've been exposed, and they can be, you know, pre-symptomatic for two years before they actually become clinical, and that they're shedding prions in saliva, urine, feces. Um, they haven't been able to test the gut piles because they're alive at the time in the, all those research studies. But I think as the disease progresses, the internal organs and muscle tissue, everything becomes more involved. Um, and so, again, it, it's really trying to manage gut piles on the landscape, regulating hunters and how they're supposed to remove that. That's really a difficult, I think, message. We're, we're already just trying to control carcasses themselves um, for the brain and spinal column, which I still believe is the highest risk components. Um, we can provide information to hunters about gut pile management. If you have your own land, like I do, and you're harvesting deer, you might want to think about how you handle the gut pile. But I think to, um, to put that requirement on a hunter and try to regulate that would be really challenging, and it might be super burdensome at the same time. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That just strikes me that if that, <laughs> we're doing a lot of work for nothing if we're ultimately leaving prions in the field. That, that's just my comment. Um, Dr. Carson, I think you have some more pages to go through. I can, I can be quick, sure. Um, maybe I'll just skip to where we're at right now. Um, so, so far we've been collecting samples uh, since archery in our zones. Um, so this map here shows our current uh, distribution, or sorry, of, of positives, and we've had two new cases. So good news to report in the North Central is we've collected 600 samples uh, since the start of archery. We've had 538 come back as not detected, and there's 62 pending. In the Southeast, we've collected nearly 1,200 samples so far in our entire uh, zones. Uh, we've had um, 1,000 of those come back as not detected, 152 pending. We've had one new case confirmed, and that's, oh, I can show that right here, so it's just south of, of Preston. Um, but in what would have been our 603 zone, so not that far from kind of our core area. And then uh, we just found out on Friday of a new suspect case, which is in Houston County, right here. It's a little blue dot. And that's actually the exact same land that the other positive was from um, last fall. So same landowner, same cunning group. And that was a yearling female. So those are the two newest cases we have so far this year. All of our results are posted um, as quickly as we get them and available on our website. I have the link provided there. It's where hunters can check for the results and it's also to keep the public informed of what we're learning. Two slides left on the funding question. So I had a question about what did we ask for? What did we get? And how is that currently gonna be allocated? So this slide shows the request on FY20 and what was appropriated and how that appropriation came from both general fund and game and fish dollars. And included in there is the 50,000 allocated from the Wild Servant Health Fund to uh, spend on adopt a dumpster program. And that total request and appropriation there also includes the FY21 dollars. Um, and this currently is the distribution of, of how we've been allocating those funds. 72% of that budget um, has been appropriated, uh, either spent or encumbered, primarily encumbered because the fall is just starting. Um, you can see how we have it broken down there by salary. The CSU contract, that's for the testing. Uh, we have a USDA contract in place. Uh, that's for agency culling for this coming winter. Uh, so we have that set up and ready to go for work we're going to do this winter, primarily in our southeast. But it'll be dictated quite a bit on where we have disease and what sort of um, uh, positives we find this year to direct that activity. Um, other uh, sampling we have, uh, the tissue sampling there is our contracts with the universities. So these are all the students that are coming to work with our professionals opening weekend, sorry, all, all weekends of the firearm season and take samples with us. And we have a variety of other categories in there, but um, basically we've spent uh, just over $200,000 so far. Um, we have 1.7 million encumbered uh, for the total, just under, under 2 million. And I believe we're gonna expend the extent of that, if not more. Um, to try to get the work done that we're already trying to do uh, for this fall. So I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. Representative Wagenius. Thank you. Just an observation. Uh, I look at your Southeast deer movement study and the deer move across multiple counties. And then I look at your deer feeding ban and look at Cass County. And you're only going 
say, one county to the west. And it seems to me if prevention is what we're about, we should have that deer feeding ban at least multiple counties around the two areas where we found them, uh, if not statewide. But I can't understand why it's so limited. Uh, why it, not in Otter Tail County, for example, which is on the other side of Wadena. Dr. Carson. Mr. Chair, members, I think, uh, you know, with the feeding ban, we were trying to be um, uh, as precautionary as we could without um, <coughs> losing support. So a statewide ban is something, I'm a disease biologist, so I would support that easily. Uh, but I think we also have to have our, our hunting groups and stakeholders willing to support statewide implementation of a feeding ban. And so we were putting these precautions in place with the area, again, focus on highest risk um, without overreaching at the same time. But I don't disagree that, uh, that we could expand that or even consider statewide sometime in the future. And as far as prevention, 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 that's always a good thing. So I don't disagree at all. Representative Wagenius. Just look at the map and, and look at Cass County and look at, or look at Crow Wing. I mean, it does seem that your band around that needs to be bigger based on your own evidence of how, fa how far mm -hmm. a young deer moves. Mm -hmm. yep. <coughs> Any other questions? Dr. Carstensen, yesterday the North Carolina uh, Fish and Game Commission banned the use of cervid urine. Um, I think South Carolina has done that as well. Has the DNR considered uh, banning the use of attractants? Uh, Mr. Chair, we, we have it in our um, recreational feeding ban language where we have disease. So in our southeast area where the ban is and our north central zones where disease is in the wild, the attractants are included in that language and banned. Um, I think we, uh, you know, maybe would have to have additional conversations to think about, again, including feeding bans at a statewide level or attractant bans included with that would be something for future conversations. And are you going to talk about EHD? I. Uh, at any time you want me to? Uh, now. Okay. <laughs> sure. It's three slides, I swear. And I'll be out of, out of here for you. Um, so I was asked to prep uh, just a few slides on uh, a different disease uh, that we actually encountered for the first time in the wild deer in Minnesota. Uh, this is epizootic hemorrhagic disease. This is something that's been uh, widely described and prevalent in the southern parts of the U.S. Um, and we've been participating in surveillance projects for EHD. I have for the 15 years I've been doing this job, submitting serum samples at times and looking for cases that would be clinical at the right time of year. And we haven't found it in Minnesota in, in wild deer. And even though it was, has been in surrounding states, it's been kind of odd. Why don't we have it here? And what would make Minnesota different? Um, this disease is viral. It's transmitted by a biting midge. Uh, and it affects commonly white-tailed deer. There's a version of this called blue tongue virus, another hemorrhagic disease that's more common in cattle and sheep. Um, it tends to come on late summer, early fall, where uh, water resources and pools, like cattle ponds, typically dry up more at the end of summer, and that creates better breeding habitat for these midges. And that seems to be when these diseases show up in both domestic and, and wild animals where it exists. Um, it's a pretty rapid onset. Um, the clinical disease usually appears within a week, and death can be very quick. So there isn't a lot of clinical signs attributed to it in, the, in its acute stage. And the deer that I have shown in the photo is actually one found dead in Houston County that was confirmed with the disease. So that's what it looked like when the landowner encountered it. Totally fine, normal, and good physical condition, but abruptly dead. Um, and so the, these midges, you know, I was right away interested in how we got this disease here now. Um, so they're not born with this virus. They're the, they're the vector that transmit it. So they have to have an infected host to bite to spread the disease. And in consulting with um, Dr. David Stalnick, who's one of the leading researchers on this disease in the U.S., um, and he works out of, out of Squidus and South, uh, University of Georgia, um, he said that it's really difficult to ever pinpoint because animals such as a cow that might have gotten bitten can be viremic for up to 50 days. So they can have the virus for 50 days in an infectious state where they're not symptomatic and be moved around through cattle sales. Similarly, midges themselves can be uh, lifted up into air currents and transmitted or transported, sorry, hundreds of miles in the right condition. So just the, you know, the, the odds of trying to figure out how it got here and why, it says it's extremely difficult uh, because of all those variables. The deer are often found dead near water due to the fever part of this disease. 
It can do some high mortality rates locally. So where it pops up, it can kill a lot of deer, but it isn't typically a population level concern. Um, so it can be a concern in a local area, but it typically is confined to that. Again, I mentioned it's very common in the south. Um, we have had this case uh, in Cattle Farm reported in 2012. We had it in a captive deer herd in Goodhue County in 2018. It was never found in Minnesota in wild deer prior to this year. And there's really no management activity uh, available to really combat this disease. And it's also not a threat to humans. So just a quick timeline of what happened this past fall is we had the first report, basically Labor Day weekend, in Stearns County um, that came in uh, about a site that had a uh, uh, multitude of dead animals that were found, dead deer. Staff investigated. Uh, most of the carcasses had been dead quite some time, so it's likely they were there for a week or two before the landowner uh, discovered the magnitude of what was dead on the property. Two whole carcasses were recovered um, and confirmed uh, through testing uh, at the University of Minnesota and then confirmation at the Net National Vet Services Lab that it was EHD. And that continued in that area in Stearns County for the next couple weeks with about 30, 30 deer reported, six confirmed uh, with EHD when we were able to collect parts or the spleen. Um, but it's likely an underestimate because that's just what was reported and there was definitely others that probably weren't reported. And then in Houston County, um, the Board of Animal Health reported a, a white-tailed deer herd, a captive farm with two mortalities in early September. And then we started to find wild deer also um, in that county being reported. We had about 50 reports on 16 properties <coughs> with confirmation of EHD. They were also always ruled out for chronic wasting disease at the same time. And uh, again, similar to Stearns County, I believe that's an underestimate of probably the mortality that occurred because it's just what folks were reporting. And we did have some reports in Winona County, but those were too far decomposed. And just uh, for kind of perspective, this is what happened in Iowa this year. So Iowa reported uh, quite an extensive outbreak of EHD in southern Iowa. Uh, they have just under 2,000 reported cases of mortality, focused a lot in Warren and Madison counties. Um, they had a few uh, other cases reported, but whenever they have an event, they just assume similar reports are likely hemorrhagic disease related. And so they had a more extensive outbreak than Minnesota did, but neither Wisconsin nor Michigan uh, had much of a EHD year this year. So it was limited to two counties in our state, uh, but Iowa had kind of the bulk of the, the disease. That's what I have for you on that. Any questions, members? So as farmers are out picking corn or uh, in the field, have you done any outreach if they are finding carcasses? If, if deer just drop with the HD, how, how do you do? Have you done any work on surveillance for notification? Um, Mr. Chair, um, when we had the, uh, the cases confirmed, we did do press release and outreach that made it into most of the outdoor news media anyway. Um, and then uh, at the local level, um, reports that were coming in were reported to DNR or conservation officers and then followed up with when we could uh, with trying to get samples. But I think, as you mentioned, the other cases are just being uncovered now as they're, you know, they're combining corn. And, uh, and those animals probably had been dead for quite some time at this point. With the weather now just turning, as soon as frost comes, the disease uh, epizootic is pretty much over. Um, so I think that uh, we're probably through the disease outbreak now. But yeah, they're going to probably discover some deer. And if they do, we hope they report that so we can document the extent of the outbreak. But there isn't uh, you know, continued communication or outreach about what they might discover at this point. Thank you. I think we're going to move on to uh, Mr. Kessitz. And as uh, he is coming forward, uh, members, we had handed out uh, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund work plan. This is the, we've been talking about dollars earlier, and there's a, a single sheet that shows the funding for previous appropriations, including the deer movement study, and then the appropriation that came uh, to the university. Here's the work plan that was adopted by the Legislative and Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources, if you have any questions about that. And Dr. Larson will be discussing that. And again, members, I know some of you have to go, but we are going to keep rolling here to make sure we provide the public with information um, from the agencies and the university and the public. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Peter Chesset. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. I also represent the Board of Animal Health. 
Uh, with me today are two of my colleagues, one from the Meat and Dairy Inspection Division, the other from the Food and Feed Safety Division. Uh, they're going to assist in uh, answering any questions the committee might have regarding processing and food handling. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Thompson with the board sends her regrets for being unable to be here. She and a large number of her staff are actually at a conference uh, out east in which they're discussing a lot of the issues that have been discussed here today. However, uh, the, the board, Dr. Thompson did submit written testimony to the committee, should be in all of your members' packets. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to briefly go over the testimony or would we like to just start with processing questions? Maybe questions and uh, Mr. Kermeyer, this is all going to be posted, correct, the letters? They will open it up for questions. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So on uh, page two of the, the letter, the written testimony, Regarding Section 6, Subdivision 7A inspection fees, it references that um, BAH is now gathering information on the usage of each herd. Um, do you have that information, or can it be can it be provided to the committee? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I do not have that information, but we can certainly provide it to you and the committee. Thank you. Any questions? So there are two sheets. There's the letter, and then there's the farm servant program. Any questions from members? I think following up on the, the dumpster discussion, which I believe you were here for, uh, does the Department of Ag, uh, you operate the, the uh, venison donation program, do you have you have a website for that? We provided some more reimbursement for the processors. Have you seen any fall off in the number of processors? One, participating in the venison donation program, and two, taking either whole deer or processed deer at this time. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I believe I'll, I'll ask my colleague uh, to introduce herself and address that question. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, representatives and senators, my name is Lisa Wetzel. I am the training and outreach coordinator, uh, our unit director for the Dairy Meat Inspection Division. In regards to the venison donation program, we currently have 27 processors registered this for this year's season uh, with one in process. Uh, I believe that's similar to last year's numbers. And then as far as other processors, um, processing deer, I don't know that we have that data collected. Um, you know, when we send out the venison donation program letter, we sent that to 300 processors. Uh, some of those are equal to processors. Some of those are custom processors. Some of those come under the food and feed uh, safety regulation and that they're retail processors as well as some are USDA inspected. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was hoping this was in the, uh, the information, um, but, and maybe this is for, for uh, Petter. Um, how many, so we've got 349 herds. How many of them are compliant already with the redundant gating? Uh, to date, 56 of the producers have been confirmed to have the redundant uh, gates already in place. Producers do have till the 1st of December to, uh, um, to ensure that they have the appropriate fencing and redundant gate systems that the new regulations require. Thank you. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As long as no one wants to ask questions, I guess I'll, I'll prolong it a little. Um, we, we find the, the prions and your testing, and then we've just been told it's mostly in the brain and the spinal cord. 
uh, how common is it to find these prions in the meat? And as long as we got our, our packing folks there, uh, at, a, at a certain point when you cook this meat, uh, and I hate, hate to even ask these questions because nobody wants to even consider eating an infected deer, but if there should be some in there and, and you're cooking it at a certain temperature, well done, what is the risk? Because when I was reading on the risk on some of these things, uh, they actually had to, in, in studies, they actually had to try to transfer this into other animals. And very few animals pick it up. In fact, in one case, I think with mice, they had to inject the prion into their brain to get them to, to catch it. So what is the risk if, if the meat is cooked well? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, um, I do not know. Do my colleagues know? I think Dr. Larson's ready back there, too. If you... <laughs> Chair Hanson, members of the committee. So there is risk there. There is risk there. There are these uh, misfolded prions present in the meat and present in the lymph nodes. They enrich the lymph nodes. And um, cooking does not render them non-infectious. It just it doesn't. And, and these are these are resistant um, to high temperatures. And so there is risk there. What what and what I'll talk about in, in my presentation coming up is trying to understand that risk trying to understand the science of, of these prions and uh, really what that risk poses to humans. But um, uh, these prions are um, throughout the animal in low levels. Uh, as Dr. Carson said, over time they enrich in the spinal cord and the brain. But before that time they are at, at a smaller level in uh, lymph nodes that may end up in, in meat. It may end up in ground venison. Dr. Shepherds has, has some data um, suggesting that. Um, it can also be in the meat, and so. But the, the 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 issue is, what level is that, and does that pose a risk? And that's where we need to have scientists. We need to have scientists working on that issue. And that's part of what we're trying to do. Representative Green. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And and uh, there again, we'll go back to we've been studying this for a lot of years, and we need to have scientists working on the issue, but apparently they are working on the issue. And, and so what I'm asking is, you know, as now, and, and I don't claim to be an expert at all, but I have done some reading, and so far they have not been able to get this, even in testing where they've tried to transfer to other animals, it's, it's very hard to get it to transfer over. So my question is, what is the risk? Uh, Chair Hanson, members of the committee, I would say that um, there are definitely uh, challenge experiments out there where they feed, they feed a rodent model, they feed uh, 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 deer, they feed animals prions in these challenge experiments, and they do develop a neurogenic disease. So uh, there's research out there showing that. And in fact, if you look at the spectrum of uh, TSEs, so this is a prion disease, <coughs> mad cow disease, BSE is a prion disease, scrapie is a prion disease, CWD is a prion disease. There are decades and decades of, of, of research projects focused on these prion diseases. And the most common route for these is ingestion, is consuming. Um, and so it's important to understand the science that's been done on these prion diseases. And it supports um, uh, our concerns of, of, of potential risk of consuming CWD. And so I think that's a critical point that gets lost in a lot of this discussion is that we need to understand what's been done on scrapie, what's been done on BSC or mad cow. Um, and, and there's definitely plenty of, of uh, science experiments that have done, been done showing that ingestion is a common route. And Dr. Larson, I think you testified last spring that there were incidental uh, cross contamination from not ingestion of small rodents in environments where there were prions. Correct. Uh, Chair Hansen, um, the question is, uh, you know, what, how, how does this, how can this be spread in the landscape? What are the risks to other animals? Uh, we know that, that small mammals, rodents, raccoons, coyotes can serve as mechanical vectors. Do they get the disease? No, there's, there's not evidence suggesting that, but they can spread it around the environment. There is limited evidence coming out of the USDA and other groups that um, distant related primates, maybe even swine, some, uh, some animals can develop uh, uh, um, a neurogenitive condition after being exposed to CWD prions. So this is what the latest science is suggesting. There's a lot that um, 
that goes into that that we need to understand when thinking about potential risk to humans and species barriers. I do want to go back to ag and board of animal health if that's possible and then we'll, we'll keep moving here. Um, so I think the earlier question with the processors, so let's just take an average deer hunter who has the deer and is going to bring their whole deer to a processor and they come, are they going to see a sign that says we do not take deer anymore? Or are they going to come and see a sign that says we do not take whole deer anymore? Um, and I, sorry, Senator Rude, you had a question as well. Right? Um, I was just, um, I, I see in Dr. Thompson's letter um, that the board has revoked uh, registration of three facilities. Um, could you um, address that? I mean, what, why, why was their registration um, revoked on those? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I do not actually have the specifics of those revocations. Uh, I can certainly see if we can get those to you. Um, depending on where they might be at at the process, that might not be information that we can share, but I can certainly look into that and get back to you. Thank you. Back on the processing question. Oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, in terms of um, the signs that hunters might see uh, at their local processors. We've heard anecdotally that uh, some processors have stopped taking deer. I don't think we have a full sense of the scale of 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 that. Um, I don't think I I don't think we've been inundated with calls. Uh, we do not have any reports at this time, actually that folks have stopped um, processing or accepting full deer or partial carcasses. And Mr. Chair, um, Senator Rood. Uh, I will tell you that my processor from that, that we've used for years is no longer taking deer so in our area, which, and I'm from the Crow Wing County area, so. Okay. And that would be the concern with nine, ten days out if just we've been we spent about an hour on the dumpsters, but what about bringing it to processing? And a lot of people don't have the ability to process their own anymore, and so they may be riding back home and then bring it to a location, and there's the sign on the door, um, and then what? And I think that's when the phone will ring, or at least <coughs> ours probably will. So any outreach or any effort of places that do take deer whether it's whole or, or part or trim, would be helpful, I think, to inform people of what's available. Uh, and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, we do have a list uh, via the venison donation program of processors that are, you know, at least to our knowledge, still accepting uh, deer for processing. Uh, we can certainly look into ways of, uh, you know, working with the DNR and, um, and interested uh, parties to try and uh, do that outreach that you suggested. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Larson, Dr. Sheffers, uh, Dr. Osterholm is not going to be here today. So the, you know, Dr. Larson, uh, you've been at the mic already, but uh, welcome. Chair Hansen, Acting Co-Chair Rude, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Dr. Peter Larson. I am a um, assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical and Veterinary Sciences at the College of Veterinary Medicine. With me here today is Dr. Jeremy Sheffers, who is an uh, assistant professor in um, the vet Veterinary Population Medicine Department, is also at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. So if there are questions that come up about that digester, additional questions about uh, waste disposal, um, Dr. Sheffers is, is happy to help answer those questions. Last two weeks ago, I, I testified uh, at the congressional hearing in Washington, D.C. My written testimony largely focused on the research areas that we need to pursue to give us a, a leg up on the battle against chronic wasting disease. I also talked about something really important, that's the heritage of deer in North America. 
This is a book published by Teddy Roosevelt back in 1902. This is all about the deer family of North America. It's over 300 pages that Teddy Roosevelt wrote in that most important time of his life. So in all these discussions about chronic waste needs, I want to make sure that there's something that unites all of us here in this room, and that's the heritage of deer. Humans have been connected with deer for centuries in North America. We need to understand that heritage. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, quickly go over our research activities and our um, uh, primary working team in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I'll highlight a few uh, uh, research advances um, that have been made um, across the university. What's become abundantly clear and uh, even evident today in the, in, the, in the questions that have been asked is that chronic waste disease requires an, a really an organized research effort. That means bench work uh, and boots on the ground. We need to have scientists, um, postdocs, students working in laboratories at the University of Minnesota on this issue. This is part of what we're trying to do. We need to have people working in the field, collaborating with the, the DNR, the Board of Mental Health, um, working on, on critical issues with respect to the ecology of the disease. And so what we are proposing and what we're trying to organize, and I'm helping to lead this effort, is what's called the Minnesota Center for Prion Research and Outreach, or MinPro. And I think all of you have a handout um, uh, that discusses uh, MinPro and, and what our vision is. But we need to have a multidisciplinary center at the University of Minnesota that strategically focuses on prion and protein misfolding diseases. This would be a research hub for combating chronic waste disease and other neurogenic diseases. There are common threads across neurogenic disease from CWD, scrapie, and mad cow disease, all the way to Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and ALS. And we need to understand how these are connected. And I think the only way that we can do that is by bringing together uh, scientists from unique backgrounds that can form a think tank environment. The back of that handout that you have, that you have here today is focused on um, chronic waste disease, We've outlined some primary CW research avenues that we were proposing uh, within the center level research effort. That includes the next generation diagnostic tools that I'll mention later on. But also looking at the environmental impact in the state, there are unique aspects of the ecology of Minnesota that we have to do a better job trying to understand. We have to understand how these prions in our environment, um, uh, how they are going to be uh, uh, potentially binding to different soil types, to different biomes across Minnesota. That's unique to our state, and, and this is part of the reason why we're perform, uh, proposing a center-level research effort. We need to understand, better understand transmission routes in our state, ecological modeling, but also once I believe that once uh, we make progress on the diagnostic front, there's going to be avenues, downstream avenues, years from now, um, where we can look at things like vaccines and potential therapeutics, and I think that if we're going to be successful in the effort, that requires center-level research. So you'll be hearing more about MIMPRO in the coming months as we try to organize that. The first research that I'd like to highlight um, coming out of the College of Vet Med is from Dr. Tiffany Wolf. Dr. Wolf is assistant professor in, in the VPM department. She's a wildlife epidemiologist. She's working with the Minnesota Grand Portage Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa Tribe to establish a tribal CWD surveillance network. This is something that we need to work together on now. We need to prepare for what may happen in the future. Dr. Wolf is leading this, um, this effort. She'll be collaborating with the DNR and others. She recently was awarded a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Tribal Wildlife Grant for about 200 k to support that effort. And so uh, Dr. Wolf is, is, is doing a good job of trying to plan in the future of how, how we can help our tribal nation um, uh, have a, a CWD surveillance uh, network put in place. Dr. Scott Wells professor in the Department of uh, Vet Veterinary Population Medicine. He's also an epidemiologist. Dr. Wells has three forthcoming papers on CWD exposures on 34 cervid farms, both in Minnesota and Wisconsin. His major finding that he'll be publishing soon is the identification of at least 11 CWD positive farms that were not considered high risk farms. These are farms that never had an imported animal from a, from a known CWD source. Those farms are located in areas near CWD positive wildlife. The farms had a mixture of single and double fenced uh, barriers. And so what, it, what his results show is that the transmission routes of this disease are complex. We don't quite have a good understanding of them yet. And there's a link um, in the digital copy of this presentation that, that provides you uh, more information, Dr. Wells's information, or research information. Highlighting the CW Diagnostic Development Team, any of you familiar with us, we per, uh, appeared before this committee last spring. Um, 
I've also listed some of the collaborators that we have that were helping us advance the diagnostic research that we're proposing and I'll sort of step through our, our developments over the last uh, few months. So just to remind everyone, um, our goal was to develop advanced CWD diagnostics that are faster, more sensitive, easier to use, and to develop a prototype or prototypes within two years. And um, we believe that we can develop uh, diagnostic tests that will be functional with hunter harvested deer, live deer, and environmental samples. We secured over $2 million. Those funds were distributed in July. And that's through the Rapid Egg Response Fund and $1.8 million from the Minnesota Legislature through the LCCMR Fund. We thank, we thank the state for those funds. Since July, we've hired four research staff, three graduate students have been brought, brought onto the team. We're continuing our collaboration with the DNR, the Board of Mental Health. We also have had partners emerge like Oxbow, Oxbow Park, um, also collaborating with hunters to secure as many tissues as we can to use for our initial research projects focus on developing uh, new diagnostic tests. Anytime a positive animal is discovered, we've asked the, the DNR, the Board of Mental Health to share that information with us so we can act quickly to secure tissue samples from those individuals because they re represent valuable sources of um, material that we can perform our initial tests on. We've also outfitted a primary prion research laboratory. This is in the College of Veterinary Medicine. We believe this, we view this as a cornerstone of MinPro. Um, this is a wet lab that is around 1,000 square feet. Um, you can see uh, here, this is about, I, I would say, 90% outfitted. We're still waiting on a few pieces of equipment, but it's really exciting because with the uh, generosity of the state, we've been able to outfit um, this exceptional research lab where, that will facilitate a wide variety of, of projects focused on CWD and related disorders. Also, like to highlight Dr. Pam Skinner's laboratory. Um, if you recall, Dr. Skinner has proposed, and this is outlined in the in the work plan, the LCCMR work work plan that you have, that blood-based RNA biomarkers can be used to identify CWD infections early on in the process. The exciting news on this front is that one of her collaborators in Canada, they have identified diagnostic microRNAs. These are really tiny pieces of RNA that float through the blood. They've identified a handful of these microRNAs that they believe are diagnostic of CWD and can identify early, detect, uh, can detect CWD early. So Dr. Skinner's lab will, uh, will focus on these small biomarkers and they will test those biomarkers in white-tailed deer sampled um, throughout Minnesota and obviously any positive samples that we secure early on. The primary object objective of that group is to utilize blood samples from recently harvested or live deer to detect CWD infections. So, one of the most exciting aspects of this wet lab that we've out, outfitted is that we now have RT-Quick uh, functionality. RT-Quick, this is a, a diagnostic method that has received a lot of attention um, over the last, I would say, five years. Um, this is a method that can be used to detect prions in soil, in tissues, in blood, in feces, and even uh, nasal swabs. And uh, the USDA and Rocky Mountain Labs have been working on, on this RT-Quick method for a while. This leverages the biology of prions. It leverages the biology of how a CWD prion can spread. Essentially, you can take a sample um, and, and, and amplify, you can amplify the misfolded CWD prion protein and use that, a, a machine called a, a plate reader. And this is in the lower right-hand corner. You can see our graduate student, Mansi Lee, with this plate reader. That plate reader can take about 96 samples at a time. And, and so RT-Quick promises to have high throughput capability. Um, we're gonna use this method, this RT-Quick method, to screen over 500 uh, samples that were provided by the DNR. Those samples contain uh, mostly CWD not detected uh, tissue samples, but they also contain a few positives mixed in there. So we're gonna work through those samples with this RT-Quick method to see if we can identify blindly, we won't know beforehand which animals are positive. positive. And the question is, can we use RT-Quick to identify those individuals that were CWD positive um, independently of what the DNR uh, had found? And if we can, that gives us confidence moving forward. Part of our diagnostic research and development effort is gonna focus on streamlining this RT-Quick method. Right now, it's technically complex. It, it requires um, a lot of resources. Uh, it, it requires specialized staff, but we think that there's ways that we can improve upon that, um, and that could result in a, uh, a, a better, faster, cheaper chest that could be used for 
hunter harvested deer, live deer, but also environmental samples. We're also focusing on antibody engineering. This is, we've identified some new methods that, um, that can generate uh, novel antibodies, small antibodies. Um, we believe that we can identify antibodies that would have greater binding affinity to C misfolded CWD prions. Um, the, the, the objective of this research is that we believe that we can improve upon many of the currently available diagnostic tests with these novel antibodies. And um, we believe that these novel antibodies can also be used in Dr. O's laboratory to develop more sensitive microfluidic-based devices, biosensors. And Dr. O is developing, um, performing rather, uh, microfluidics experiments uh, right now um, in this realm. And so you'll be hearing more in the coming months about this effort. We've had access to the funds for a little over three months now, um, but we anticipate to have some uh, um, exciting results within uh, the next few months, updates in spring and early summer. What I want everyone to, to understand here today is that there's multiple re, uh, research groups across the United States working in this same area, next generation CWD diagnostics. Um, this is an area, there's a reason why, and, and, and there's technological advance, advancements that have been made over the past five years. And so this area of, of improving prion-based diagnostics is ripe for discovery. And we're just one of several teams across the United States working on this effort. There's a press release that was released September 30th. Uh, Michigan, Michigan is, is, um, has funded $900,000 to Michigan State University to, and if you read that, um, get RT Quick up and running. And then they're also going to look at improving RT Quick for real time surveillance. This is almost exactly identical to what, what we were talking about last year during our efforts, um, uh, during a testimony last spring. So I want everyone to understand that this is, this is an area that, um, uh, several groups are working on. We're going to compare notes at some point down the road. There's, there's IP involved, there's patents involved, sure. But uh, um, uh, what's happening gives us greater confidence that what the ideas that we proposed hold our, our, our value, hold value, and that they're promising lines of research. Education outreach. So I testified here uh, early last spring and I fielded a number of questions about what, what the University of Minnesota, what is the University of Minnesota doing on education and outreach? And I got the message, I got the message. We need to do a better job of that. So we've done a few things in the College of Veterinary Medicine. This is through the Center for Animal Health and Food Safety. We've developed a website. Uh, this is a CWD Watch website. There's a link to it there. On this website, we have animations. So we had this extremely talented undergraduate student who was able to take an idea that I had. I woke up one morning and I was like, we need to have an animation about how a deer can get exposed to prions. How does that, how do the prions move through that deer? How, how, how can that help us understand transmission routes in nature? So if you go to that website, um, you'll look at that, that animation that, that we were able to put together with this incredibly talented uh, undergrad at the University of Minnesota. There's also um, interviews. There's interviews with experts in the field that we're gonna be releasing. We have you talks. These are TED-style talks from UMN experts. There's four talks up there now, including one from uh, Lou Cornicelli from the DNR. These, uh, uh, this is content that will be growing in the coming months. Um, we'll have uh, lectures um, made available and put on there. This is all an effort to help people understand the science of, of prion biology, to understand CWD. We have handouts, links to the DNR, Board of Animal Health, um, uh, we also have an interactive CWD timeline in Minnesota that you can go on and you can see the first case of CWD and you can pan across that timeline and you have an idea of what the major events are in CWD. So it's got a lot of functionality. I also want to highlight the SIDRAP Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. They also have a, a very uh, a nice website that has a lot of information about chronic wasting disease, news, maps, and that's uh, linked to their website is provided here. One of the most exciting things that we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the public on are these augmented reality CWD displays, and they're out here outside of the um, outside of the room here today. These uh, are displays that um, you can actually go up to with your cell phone. Let's see if the video works. So there's an app. There's an app that you can download, and that's on a sign out there. Um, you can interact with these displays in different ways to get information. Right, you, this, is, this has been a hit for, uh, at the Bell Museum, but also 
uh, with students down at Winona State. You can see um, there in, in the, on the left-hand side, me with students down at Winona State from a few weeks ago. These displays are portable. They're easy to set up. They can travel around the state. And so this is one area that, that we're trying to fill knowledge gaps here. We're trying to, we're trying to reach out to students, to, to individuals of the public um, in different ways and identify different ways to connect with them uh, about how to better understand CWD and, um, and prion biology. We had an event at the Bell Museum. This was on the 14th of September. This was organized by the CAFS team. We invited members from the DNR, the Board of Mental Health, the Elk Breeders Association, this is where those TED style talks occurred and we had the interactive displays there and Dr. Sheffers had this excellent setup. He actually had a microscope there with slides showing CWD prions. So the public was able to go and actually view prions underneath a microscope uh, with the help of Dr. Sheffers. And I don't know anyone else that's been able to do that and I think that that was a great success and I think we need to build on that. We need to, we need to make that um, almost an annual event. But all the talks from, from that Bell Museum event um, uh, are available on that CWD Watch website. And I want to say that we need to have more events like this where we bring together all the major players, all the stakeholders on this, so we can have discussions together and we can understand this disease uh, better by learning from each other. I personally have conducted a number of CWD seminars across the state. Um, these are focused on prion biology and the science of CWD. I've given lectures at the University of Minnesota, um, but also outreach activities at Eagle Bluff and Red Wing at Winona State uh, uh, University. And there's, a diff there's additional outreach events planned in the coming months. I've hired someone um, on our, our MinPro staff that is going to help to coordinate this outreach effort and to help uh, reach out to stakeholders and, and, and deer hunters. So to summarize the, this. I think we have a question. Reverend yeah, Lee. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Dr. Larson. Can you just talk a little bit more about uh, the outreach to communities who are limited English speakers? Around yeah, that's an, an excellent point. And that's something that we need to do a better job of. And we need to, as we're pulling this together now, we're newly formed and we're just bringing that together. And so we need to have that component in our outreach activities, absolutely. And that's something I can talk with the, the Center for Animal Health and Food Safety about. I think, I think that we have a great a um, uh, set of tools now, and I think we can diversify, and we can use those to have a, an impact in a broad swath of uh, uh, throughout the, the public of Minnesota, for sure, absolutely. So there's a critical need uh, for um, event, uh, additional prion science outreach, and this is something that we've identified as a product of going out and, and, and talking with those around the state. There's this mis misunderstanding and fear about chronic wasting disease, the causative agent. It's not a bacteria. It's not a virus. It's a prion. There are uh, uh, a number of exceptional experiments that have been done uh, throughout decades of research showing that it is a prion. Um, and we need to, to, to understand how those were done and, and, and understand what a prion is. And um, we've identified the method. Actually, I have to give credit to uh, an exceptional scientist and educator, my wife, who came up with the idea of this analogy of a, a slinky for a prion. And using a slinky, you can show how a normal prion might move. We all have prions, and you can use the slinky to show that functionality. But when you take that slinky and you curl it up and you mess it up, that can become a CWD that's analogous to a CWD prion. We use that in these outreach events. And that's something I talked to at the congressional hearing um, uh, a couple weeks ago, and that was a big hit. It's because it's the first time that someone, that people have been able to visualize what a prion is and how it may spread through the body. And so this is something we've incorporated to our, our outreach activities to some success. There's also a misunderstanding and fear about the risk um, to humans. And understanding that risk requires an understanding of the diversity of prion mm -hmm. diseases out there. And this is a slide that, um, uh, that I've put together that on one end of the spectrum, this prion disease spectrum, you had mad cow disease, BSE, and there's about 177 people that have died from that, and people are still dying from that. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have scrapie, and that's been known since 1732, and there's no evidence of scrapie crossing over into humans. Chronic wasting disease lies somewhere on that spectrum, and we don't know where that is yet. There's concern, but understanding that concern of chronic wasting disease and the risk that it uh, poses to humans requires a better understanding of chronic wasting disease strain variation across the United States. What's the three-dimensional shape of the prions, misfolded prions, and all these different deer populations across the state? Are there any shapes that would 
fit with a human prion and cause it to change? We don't know that yet. And so that's a research area that we need to focus on. Yeah. Understanding that is going to better understand potential risk to humans. And just a couple of slides, uh, Chair Hansen asked that I could highlight um, EHD. And I won't uh, uh, say much beyond what um, Michelle, uh, Dr. Carsonson <laughs> said here, but there's potential confusion between EHD and CWD. And I provided some information uh, from the Quality Deer Management Association. <coughs> on, on the left column there, you see information about EHD. And on the right, you see information about chronic wasting disease, CWD. So EHD is caused by a virus. CWD is caused by um, prions. And you can go through uh, uh, that list and, and, and get a, a good understanding about what EHD is and how that compares um, to CWD. Provided a, a, a list of recent CWD publications. There's some excellent reviews that have been published over the past uh, uh, few months, a um, couple years. Uh, the recent publication by SIDRAP and Dr. Osterholm et al. Um, that's an opinion and hypothesis paper, and that link is provided there. Some excellent information in that paper. Uh, but also, there's a, been a number of advancements in CWD and, and prion research. Uh, I've included papers here that talk about uh, the usage of that 40% that um, bleach mixture to uh, disinfect stainless steel surfaces. That informa information needs to be handled carefully. Bleach is toxic. We don't want people to think that they can clean uh, things beyond stainless steel with 40% bleach. So we have to be very specific that this is something that has showed promise for stainless steel surfaces, not, not uh, wood, like, you know, it's handles of, 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 of knives or uh, tissues or anything like that. It's, it's stainless steel. And so we need to be very careful. And we don't all want people to think um, that, uh, that you could wash your hands maybe with a bleach solution to help prevent prions. So there's risk there. And so I just need to be careful about how, um, about how uh, we share the information about bleach. But 40% has been shown to render uh, CWD prions non-infectious on stainless steel surfaces. There's also advancements in the RT Quick method for live animal testing, environmental testing, using soil samples. Uh, in the previous testimony, there was questions about um, that, that, that leachate and about ash from some of these burning pits. I think that we could try to test some of that using this RT Quick method. Why not? Why not try that? And we can understand maybe, maybe we can understand whether or not there's some of these misfolded prion proteins in there and, and what that risk is. There's some issues with. Uh, um, you know, throughput, how many, how much that testing we could actually do. But the, the basic, the fundamental part of this is that we're going to be the first lab in the state of Minnesota to have this RT quick functionality. That opens up a variety of options for us. And if we expand on that method and we grow through that MinPro center, then we can leverage that and we can use that to help answer all, a lot of these questions about transmission routes. And that's something that we really need to do. Uh, there's been some uh, recent publications on uh, recontamination of farms. Um, uh, prions have been shown. There's this one publication here at the top of this page that showed that these misfolded prions can actually be uh, within dust and dust in, in, in farm buildings um, that have experienced a CWD or scrapey, scrapey rather, outbreak, a prion um, uh, disease scrapey outbreak. And so we need to better understand about potential reservoirs for these misfolded uh, uh, prions in, in buildings and things of that nature. So with that, I conclude um, this presentation today. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, and I want to thank you all for the support that you've provided the University of Minnesota and our team over these past few months. Thank you. Any questions? Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and to the testifier, you know, you, you mentioned that the, there's a lot of universities doing the same thing. How much of the work is redundant? I mean. Are we, are we doing the exact same thing that they're doing in Michigan and, and, and spending money in Michigan and in Minnesota to, to study the exact same thing? Chair Hansen, members of the committee, um, the question is how much work is redundant around these different universities? And uh, I would say at this point, um, we are functioning, proceeding as independent research units with individual ideas and ways to solve these problems, especially with this novel diagnostic development. There's potential IP and patents that um, uh, that all these research groups are, 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 are navigating. As we develop and publish papers, um, then that information becomes shared and then that 
uh, provides uh, research avenues to, to other groups that may not be um, working in those same areas. A certain level of redundancy is very, very important in science. We have to replicate. We have to replicate these methods. We have to, to understand that one, if one lab does it, can another lab replicate those same methods? That's a fundamental component of science. And that gives, gives greater credibility to, to all that we do. I view it was what happened um, in this area as Minnesota led the way. They led the way. They, they, you know, they funded our, our team um, to help you know, launch this effort to develop new diagnostics. I think other states are going to see that. Other states will follow suit, and I hope there's a, a domino effect because that's a win. That's a win in the battle against CWD. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in other words, there's a lot of redundancy. And so you're doing the same thing over and over again. No, sorry, did, did I'm sorry. You, I wouldn't, I wouldn't did you say that. test the, uh, um, the work of Dr. Bastian? Did you try, try to uh, recreate his work here in Minnesota? Uh, Chair Hansen, members of the committee, I would say that um, there's a reason why there's only one person publishing on the potential aspect of, of bacteria contributing to uh, 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 prion disease. I would say that there are um, uh, plenty of, of, of teams out there over the years that have shown without a doubt, without a doubt, that you could take a, 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 a sample that contains infectious prions, you can submit that to radiation, you can destroy all bacteria, destroy all viruses on that sample. The only thing that could possibly remain are these misfolded prions, and that material is infectious and can cause an urge of disease in their challenge experiments. So I think that there's an abundance of, of data showing um, uh, that uh, these misfolded prions are the causative agent. And again, we have to understand mad cow disease, the science of mad cow disease. These are transmissible um, spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. So CWD is part of that spectrum of these diseases. And so uh, the, all the work on Scrapey, on creutzfeldt jakob disease in humans, on BSE, all that is so important because CWD falls on that spectrum. And the the, uh, um, uh, what the science shows is that uh, CWD is caused by this misfolded prion, not a, a bacteria. Representative Green. And, and that may very well be, doctor. I'm not, not questioning that. But I, what I am saying is that you do, you do redundant testing over and over again on prions, and I realize prions is your work. But, but apparently you're not trying to recreate this, uh, uh, this other test of Dr. Bastian. And, and that was one of his points as well, that when you say that no one has been able to recreate what he did, uh, his, his statement was no one has tried. Chair Hansen, and so, no, and so, I, I, I'm uh, sorry, if, but people if, have tried. If the, if, the, um, if the work that you're doing is on prions and you're looking for funding for prions, and then now you're doing CWD, but not looking at anything else, uh, that's a little disturbing, you know, that that you're not saying, you know, is, is, it, is it just not possible then that a bacteria could affect a prion? Chair Hansen, members of the committee, um, people have tried to replicate Dr. Bastian's experiments. Those experiments failed. They did not result in neurogenic disease. Um, and, and so those experiments have been done. And I would add that uh, we are not just simply replicating everything else that everyone has done. No, a certain level of that replication is important for the scientific method. But part of what we're doing and part of why the University of Minnesota is so exciting is that we're innovative. We are thinking about, about new solutions to these challenges. We're thinking outside the box. And we're leveraging decades, decades of research in this area to help us propel and make discoveries into the future. And so I think that aspect is, is really important to understand. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to, to point out for the, the public, and so we have this on the record, but there's uh, an Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies technical report on best management practices for prevention, surveillance, and management of chronic wasting disease that's easily Googleable. Um, and essentially, it's like over 20 different fish and wildlife agencies coming to agreement on the best practices for dealing with CWD. And it's a good resource for um, science-based cited uh, information um, kind of on the accepted uh, actual science on chronic wasting disease. So it's just a really good resource. Dr. Larson, when you were mentioning, mentioning IP, I think when it's funded by the trust, uh, the intellectual property, any proceeds from that go back to the trust. That's right. That's correct. And that's 
we're excited about that. We, you know, if, if there are patents that come out of this and this somehow brings in revenue for the state, that's fantastic. That's a win. The, 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 any revenue coming from, we think that there's going to be multiple IP that comes out of this, to be honest. And any revenue that comes back will go back to the, to the trust, absolutely. And a couple quick questions. So based on the testimony you heard about the incinerator, uh, with your best professional knowledge, will that kill the prions? I can, I can take a stab and, and Dr. Sheffers can come too. Do you want to start? Um, yeah, just I, I can take a start. I just want to tie up a few conversational loose ends. Um, Dr. Carsonson kept mentioning the word risk. I want to use another four-letter word. It's called dose. Um, when it comes to CWD and gut piles and oh, we find it in the urine, I, I think dose is a better, what a better way to look at it. For example, if we take a genetically modified mouse and we give it a prion disease, the dose in its brain is one million units per gram of tissue, hypothetically. One million. The dose in its urine is one. So it's a million fold more concentrated <coughs> in those, what I refer to as specified risk materials things like brain and spinal cord. But unfortunately, specified risk materials in deer also includes lymph nodes. And lymph nodes can be buried deep in the leg where the venison is ground up and fed. So I think just appreciating the dose of where things, we can find it. We can find a needle in a haystack and a field full of haystacks. But the dose conversation needs to be acknowledged. Um, Figuring out the dose is nearly impossible before we have these RT quick machines where we can make standardized curves and kind of figure out, okay, about how much is in soil, how, about how much is in a gut pile. Um, generally, we believe it's a very, very, very low dose. Dose has also been described as what's the difference between therapy and poison? The dose. What's the difference between health and disease? Often the dose. So when we worry about these landfill applications and urine and, and you know not brain, just keep bear in mind there's a there's a huge spectrum of, of dose. As far as incineration de denaturing uh, prion, if the mythical number is 1,500 degrees, I can believe that would do some damage but I'd have a hard time figuring out how to get a dumpster up to 1,500 degrees. So uniformly that hot. Um, I, I like the idea of just finding the positive ones and putting those in our alkaline digester and then re, and, and handling the not detected ones by common sense means. So 1,500 degrees is hot. Um, I don't know if it's uniformly possible in that, in that but but keep in mind, keep in mind, in Crow Wing, there's maybe zero or maybe one going in there today. If we get ahead of this, we won't have to deal with half of them being positive. That's a different discussion. Right. Any questions on those comments? I think the members are tired, the remaining <laughs> ones. Um, I think you, you probably saw some concern or confusion earlier because we're we're hearing all types of response of how do we do this with disposal or processors or management um, that we have a, a deer season starting the firearms season starting and we we've, we've been talking about this for several years and we've had you in front of us a year you know less than a year ago. So the, the challenges of, of our constituents asking us questions of what do I do with my deer um, are real. Um, I think they will be more intense in 10 days uh, and throughout the month of November or potentially into December. Um, I think you've done a good job of, of getting the information out you know, I think the displays and the willingness to be presenting has been extraordinary in a very short period of time. Often it takes longer to get, get the word out. But I think 
as we're dealing with risk, you have people with lots of questions, and those questions are going to continue. And measuring or managing expectations are also going to be challenging because of the unknown. That's right. And, um, you know, that we've had two positives already, or a positive and a presumptive positive. Um, so I expect there will be more. And what does that mean? And what does that mean? Um, how many can how many positive carcasses can you take at the University of Minnesota before it's I mean can you take a hundred 200 um, is, is that a realistic thing if, if we start seeing a very large expansion uh, in the next month so the alkaline tissue digester just a little bit of history um, I started as a student there in 98 we would send horses cattle, whatever, to the rendering plant. The rendering plant found traces of barbiturates, euthanasia solution, ending up in dog food. So that whole stream died. We would take uh, animal waste to a biomedical landfill during avian influenza, and we'd see raptors circle over the top and pick up chickens and drop them in people's yards. So that, that avenue dried up. So we had to dispose of our animal waste and at that time, these alkaline tissue digesters were first coming online. So what is an alkaline tissue digester? It is the, I call it Minnesota's largest pressure cooker. We can put 8,000 pounds of animal tissue in that vessel. Um, we add steam and we add soluble potash, potassium hydroxide, KOH, lye. It has a pH of 14. <laughs> which I didn't think was possible, but it does. Um, anyway, that's added at a 22% recipe rate. Um, with steam and KOH, we can seal it and put it under 60 pounds of pressure, which gives, gets the temperature up to 300 degrees. And when it's, all, when it's been cooking for six hours, there's an 85% reduction in all soft tissue. The only thing that remains is calcium carbonate basically real fragile bones. Um, I don't know of anything that could survive alkaline digestion. And the beauty of alkaline digestion for prions is prions are very resistant to heat, but they do not tolerate wide swings in pH. So what we're doing with the alkaline digestion is we're pushing it way out of its pH comfort zone and denaturing it rapidly at a very high temperature for six hours. So steam. 60 pounds of pressure. Uh, the final product has a pH of 11. That's considered sterile sewage. It's blended with city water and it's literally flushed down the toilet. Um, and then the 10% of bone ash that remains back is sent to the compost facility and composted with pen manure and other things from campus and spread on the fields. So that is alkaline tissue digestion. To do that, it costs about 40 cents a pound. Um, we've had it for 13 years. It's ran 1,250 cycles. It's digested 10 million pounds of stuff. Um, we have no problem handling the positive deer. The deer aren't very big. You know, an 8,000 pound batch is a lot of deer. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to digest non-tested animals because that's a big pile, and that's a waste of resources. But I, I'm comfortable now. I think that the DNR is, if anybody's going to contain it, Minnesota DNR is going to do it. So it, we're, I'm hoping the numbers are down and we don't have more and more and more positive. We don't turn into Wisconsin. And if that's the case, we can, we can handle 30, 40, 50. That's not a problem. 5,000 is a problem. So it all depends on how, how far the cat gets out of the bag on this one. Any questions, members? Thank you. And the displays are available, and you guys are available to go to groups or presentations? Yeah, um, we're happy to set these up at events around the state. Um, we have a few planned in the, in the coming months, weeks and months. Um, we wanted to keep them up here at the Capitol as long as we could. Uh, 
uh, for the next few days if that's possible somewhere. So yeah, I mean, just reach out to me, let me know if, if you have events where you think these would be useful and we're happy to, to send someone out there and set them up, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, public testimony, I know I think one, one of our testifiers had to leave. Uh, Mr. Ness, are you still here? Members of the committee, uh, for the record, I'm Lance Ness. I'm the president of the Fish and Wildlife Legislative Alliance and the Minnesota Conservation Federation. We have a, f a few points we'd just like you to consider in your deliberations over chronic wasting disease. Um, for several years now, we've had a resolution on our, our board on a two fence uh, for survey day farms. We would encourage that that uh, be continued. Um, as far as the uh, veterinarians that just testified, uh, we need a live test. We need to encourage them and give them the resources they need to come up with a live test. It's imperative for the farmers that ha have survey day to have that test for themselves to protect their investment and also to keep the spread of uh, chronic waste and disease at, at bay. <coughs> Until such a test is take place, we would ask that a moratorium be placed in any interstate or interstate transportation uh, of survey day until this live test is provided. And finally, we need a field test. We need a field test for the hunters in the field to determine whether or not the deer they have is infected with chronic waste disease. So we thank you, the committee, for the few minutes we've given and hope that you take our consideration under your advisement. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Ness? Anyone else from the public who would like to testify? My name is Gary Olson. I'm a deer farmer. I'm with the Minnesota Deer Farmers Association. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Well, um, there's a lot of doom and gloom that we've heard today on CWD, but there's a lot of positive things going on. I mean, there's a lot of, we're seeing really good results with genetic resistance is what our association's doing. We're seeing really pretty good testing with, uh, one thing, a point that, that he made, uh, Dr. Larson made, was ingestion. I mean, don't forget that. It enters the body through the gut. And we're seeing pretty good results with tetracycline in the feeds. And what really hurt our industry two years ago was the FDA feed directive when we can't feed tetracycline, CTC, or myosins. Well, there's, there's pretty good data, even by Prusner and Bastion both, that, sh that shows that, 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 that tetracyclines or doxycillins will actually suppress, if not even stop the progression of CWD through the gut. So go back to the ingestion thing. That's something we really need to look at, look at with FDA is we maybe we need to reinstate you know, the, the feeding of, of, of different you know, antibiotics. Another test that's going on right now that you probably aren't aware of in Texas is the feeding of humic acid. Humic acid is, 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 is being researched into sterilizing soils is what they found for the prions. Well, it is also a feed additive. So there's, I myself have it in my feed on my, my deer. And there's a test going on right now with Texas Park and Wildlife, the Texas Deer Association on positive deer. So that, you know, it, uh, that should be done in about three months, that test. So it's just, there's some positive things going on. I mean, there's, it's not all doom and gloom. There's, there is things going on in our, in our industries that, that are really starting to, to show some results, so. And, and another thing that uh, I, I do agree with the last uh, uh, the, the last speaker was uh, I think was something we need to emphasize is dose, and I think he's, there's a do there's an infectious dose. I mean, when you see all this stuff that you're doing with uh, landfills and stuff, you remember every time you're doing and compiling this, you're you're reducing the dosage, which <laughs> reduces the infectability. There is an infectable level, and we, we don't know what that is yet. So by the time you start diluting the, this, this CWD through all the different channels that they're doing, uh, they're, you're, like he said, you're reducing risk, I and mean, risk is going down. So, I mean, like I said, there's been a lot of doom and gloom preached here today, but, but there's a lot of positive things that's going on in the industries and, and research right now with CWD. Any questions? Any, qu any other presenters? Thank you. Representative becker -Finn. Yeah, not a question for the presenter, but just uh, since we're wrapping up, I just wanted to thank everyone for hanging in here for this long hearing, but it's a lot of good information. And I know the U of M, um, I did, 
I've noticed all the outreach and I think that it is helping and better informing people about what's what's going on. And then just wanted to comment on the dose uh, issue, you know, as we talk about pre on load and, you know, part of that is how much you're ingesting. And, you know, for a lot of native folks and Hmong folks and, and other people who hunt a lot and hunt to eat, uh, you know, that's the primary protein source for a lot of families. And so um, I don't want to lose sight of that piece of it because it's a greater health risk to families like mine who rely on venison um, for, you know, <laughs> many meals a week uh, is a lot different than someone that maybe does it for fun or occasionally. Um, and I, you know, whether it's brain tanning hides or, um, you know, some of our, our monk community especially uses different organs for different things that um, your average hunter maybe doesn't typically use. So just so we keep that in mind that we're not <coughs> disproportionately um, harming those communities and still making sure they can have that food source. So I uh, thank you everybody for the research on that. Any other questions? I think part of what we, we're hearing today is that businesses may make decisions on risk much quicker than the public sector or the politics may make decisions on risk. And so then the public sector responds to the business decisions. Um, we're not in session until February 11th. And so and session probably won't get done hopefully in until May, but I think the next few weeks are very critical in terms of what happens and the practical reality of how people hunt uh, in Minnesota. And I would expect that these conversations will continue in the next days and weeks uh, because the questions are going to continue on how do we deal with the practical things that we used to do we may not be able to do anymore because it may not be our decision. It may be how we are responding to other decisions that are made. So we're a long way. We have a long road ahead of us. We are adjourned.